Hello and welcome guys. Don't forget to super original author AERO 182. Have fun and enjoy. Chapter 101. Jay opened the notification class item acquired. Quickly, he checked his inventory scanning through everything, but there was nothing new there. Nothing out of the ordinary. Dot dot dot. Huh. Where's my new item? Nothing happened at first which caused some agitation, but the next second, some green gas left Jay's hand. Some of his necrotic mana was pulled from his body, and before him it floated, coalescing into a small cloud. What is going on? He looked at his hand comma of course. It was still under his control. Jay had wide eyes, uneasy as he watched this phenomenon comma he could sense that it was his necrotic energy. But he was not controlling it comma it was like it had its own mind. Suddenly, more wisps of the green gaseous mana came from the pyramid walls, some came from the ground too. It was like they were everywhere all along, much like the ambient mana in the atmosphere which permeated all things. Jay subconsciously stepped back, and it was coming from all directions now, and was all heading towards the mana that was released from his hand. It was like it had a gravitational pull. Soon, the green wisps coming got larger, turning into clouds. They were becoming even more dense now too. All of them gathered and mixed with the necrotic cloud that formed from Jay's mana. The whole pyramid was glowing green inside now. It looked like a thousand floating lanterns had been lit and left inside. Suddenly, a sound began to fill the pyramid, ghostly whispers of undead souls. Jay felt like instinctively ducking for cover, but soon he realized the sound was coming from everywhere as he looked around. Hundreds of head-shaped green glowing clouds floated in seemingly through every wall. Ah! They made soft exhaling sounds as they floated past. Jay looked more closely at them. Their eyes were glazed over and fixated on the ball of necrotic energy that left Jay's hand. They all had their mouths open, as if they wanted to consume it, comma, but after getting too close, they only became part of it, and made it bigger. These ethereal faces made whispering sounds as they passed by. One of them even flew through Jay's chest towards the gathering thick cloud. It was like he was invisible to them. Jay decided to remain quiet. He felt a strange sense of ceremony surrounding it. That it was better to keep quiet, comma, but he still had a single thought the whole time. What the fuck, what the fuck, what the comma, what the fuck. His eyes were wide open now. He had a relatively calm expression compared to his inner thoughts. Why do they have faces, shouldn't they be skulls? What the hell, that one has flowing hair. These floating heads entered the orb and swirled around it for a moment. At one point some of them poked their faces out with looks of fear on their faces. It was like they were trying to escape now. After being lured in like bugs to the light, they were now like moths in the flame, utterly consumed by it. The whispering sound was slowly dying down now, as the few last ethereal heads entered the massive ball of luminous green gas. It was swirling and spinning. But suddenly, it froze as if it paused in time. A H H H H. Ra. A A A A. What sounded like hundreds of screaming voices suddenly came from it as the massive cloud of necrotic mana contracted for a moment. The orb then released a pulse of green light, and the voices were gone. Jay didn't have time to react and would have tried to block, but his shield was in pieces, comma. Thankfully, the green pulse didn't harm him, and after realizing he was unharmed, he continued to watch. After the luminous green light left, all that was left was a black floating orb of gas which started to move again. Jay still felt like it was his own mana, even though it was no longer green, and he continued to remain silent as he watched the black cloud before him. It began to condense and contract, getting smaller and smaller. It went from being the size of Jay's butcher shop, to being the size of one of his skeletons, comma, and it was getting smaller still. Jay could walk closer now that it was shrinking in size. But out of his cautiousness, he didn't get too close. What was happening was a complete unknown. After a while it began to slow down as it became solid. Finally it was about the size of a child's fist. After being shaped into an oval it grew some small tendrils all over it. They almost seemed like hairs. Except that they were rhythmically moving. Each one of them as long as a finger. And as skinny as an arrow. Slowly, it began to float towards Jay. Oh, shit. Wait Jay backed up and quickly pulled out a luminous orb. He wanted to look at it before he would touch it. To Jay, it seemed like as soon as it touched him it would burrow under his skin and start eating him from the inside out. The light from his luminous orb revealed a wrinkled black seed-like object covered in tiny long hair-like tentacles. You Jay's face grimaced seeing it. 
It continued to float towards him, but he could also sense his own mana in it, and somehow he felt like it was a desirable treasure at the same time. I suppose I have no choice. It continued to float towards him, and he held his hand out as it gently floated into it. It feels slimy and wrinkly he thought as he held it. The small tentacle-like threads coming from it seemed to be in zero gravity as they waved about in the air. I suppose it could be worse. At least it hasn't burrowed into my stomach and laid eggs. After getting used to it, Jay wasted no time in analyzing it. Necrotic word seed, comma unique. Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces a bountiful harvest. Sowing requirements. Life. Death. Hum okay cool. A lot of ceremony for a seed. I'll have to figure it out later. Jay didn't give it much more thought, storing it away in his inventory. Chapter 102. Now what's left oh, right. The quest and the attribute points. Well, since I decided to put them into strength, I will just dump them all in. I want to be at least as strong as a level 1 Jay shook his head to himself. Oh. That feels nice. Jay felt like his body warmed up for a moment after raising his strength to 20. Okay, now the quest. He smiled, content with all the benefits that reaching level 10 gave him. Class quest acquired. Necromancer's Word Garden. Construct your tree. Tree constructed 0 slash 1. Rewards comma chalice request. Word Garden. Interesting that must be what the seed was for. How now I get a chalice and a request? Request of what? And to whom? What would I even ask for? Jay considered planting it, but realized a dungeon was obviously not a good place to do so. If I plant it, I probably won't be able to move it since it's a tree. Why does it say construct anyway? Jay raised a brow, hoping he wouldn't need to craft some sort of bone branches himself. Up until now, most of what he did was guess, test and experiment. This was his only option. I wish I had a guide of some sort, there's just so much I don't know. I was only a butcher about one month ago. I guess now I'm a gardener too. He shook his head and chuckled to himself. Okay, I better get serious, I would need to plant it somewhere secret in the real world. But where? Jay scratched his chin in thought for a moment. I will not be staying in Losla forever. It's a low level town. So I won't be staying here for long. Hum, I don't want to make any foolish decisions again either. Jay pursed his lips, remembering how weak he was without his minions. I will give it much more thought. It would be smarter to wait till I find a suitable place, and know a little more about the world. With a nod, Jay removed the notifications and finally finished his upgrade to level 10. He looked around the room for a moment, and even felt a sense of pride, as his found skeletons stood before him. He really did just conquer this pyramid and hit level 10 all on his own. I feel like I just got so much stronger Jay smiled before recapping what he got. Let's see. I got a quest, a passive, a path, another creature, and a seed. He shook his head, still smiling. He almost couldn't believe how much he had gained simply by leveling up. Next, Jay began looking around the room as he still grinned. He picked up the pile of soul stones and the three pieces of his shield. Large soul stone comma empty. Soul stone comma empty x8. Deathwalker's sentry piece x3. Now all that remains is the throne with the obvious trap above it. You Jay pointed at Sweeper. Bring me that stone. Without hesitation, the skeleton ran towards the throne, planting a foot on it and jumping. Well, I guess the throne wasn't a trap Jay shrugged. But maybe the stone is. After the skeleton leapt into the air, it tried to grab a hold of the massive floating glowing stone. The skeleton's claw-like hands reached out, but as they touched the stone, they simply went right through it. It was like a projection of light. An illusion. Jay took a step back, thinking it was definitely a trap now. Sweeper fell down and landed on its back. It clearly didn't expect the stone to be non-physical. The stone was large and kite-shaped. It glimmered for a moment and disappeared, and inside was a smaller version about the size of an egg. It gently floated down and landed on the throne. Hum Jay squinted, he didn't trust it. He expected a large spherical boulder to fall from the ceiling, and chase him out of the tomb. Go, sweeper. The skeleton went over to the throne and grabbed it this time. Jay still had a look of suspicion on his face, but to his surprise nothing happened. Huh. I guess I was wrong. He shrugged before commanding his skeleton. Okay, bring it over. Sweeper slowly crept backwards away from the throne before jumping back, 
and then ran towards Jay at its usual speed with the stone. Jay smiled lightly seeing its human-like behavior. The stone was still kite-shaped but much smaller, and would fit comfortably in Jay's hand. However, it was not glowing anymore. It was a strange yellow rock. Jay held out his hand to accept it. But again, just before Sweeper went to hand it to Jay, it dropped it on the ground before him. Damn it, Sweeper Jay was a little dissatisfied. But this was still due to his own orders which he still hadn't changed. Though for some reason he felt like Sweeper enjoyed doing this. Suddenly, a small skull popped out of the ground, grabbed the stone, and held it up for its master. Jay smiled, already appreciative of his new minion. Good, thank you, he said, grabbing the strange stone and looking at his skeletons. He was going to reprimand Sweeper, but decided not to say anything. I guess I did name him Sweeper after all he thought with a cheeky smile. The skeleton worm parasite snapped its jaws and went back underground, seemingly happy that it pleased its master. Jay analyzed the stone. Status concealer. Input, name dash. Import, level dash. Off. Status concealer. So this is why that archer was level 1. Jay realized quickly this was why it had. On all its skills. It had been bugging him since he saw the archer's stats. So it's like a disguise for stats. I'm guessing it wasn't really called a treasure guard or whatever it was called. Hum, I bet this comes in handy someday. It would be good to change my name. And people won't suspect a thing. Since they aren't allowed to see other people's skills. I could even keep myself at level 9 a big grin appeared to form on Jay's face. Oh maybe I could even escape the mage hunters by simply changing my name. Jay looked up in thought but I would have to hide my face too. I guess it could work. Wow a big grin began to form on Jay's face as he realized other possibilities. His thoughts even drifted to things such as assassination. This is probably even better than the treasure that the statue was pretending to guard. Immediately, Jay decided to activate the stone and input his details, comma, of course. He changed his level to 9. Status concealer. Input, name Jay. Input, level 9. On. The yellow stone suddenly turned black, and a yellow glow appeared over Jay's body for a moment before disappearing. Jay stored the stone in his inventory, still grinning to himself. Well, with the second pyramid down, I better go and see if Villard is ready for my lesson. Chapter 103 Jay decided to leave his skeletons to hunt more soul stones. He had all his minions stand before him, double checked that all his skeletons were back to full health before leaving the dungeon, but as he turned to his bone helminth, he paused. Hum, I recall you have a second form sentinel form was it? Let's give it a try. The necrotic worm parasite snapped its jaws a few times before it coiled its body into a threatening spring shape and diving at Jay. Jay didn't expect it to pounce at him. It was suddenly like a spear that someone threw and it was heading right towards his neck. Oh, he took a step back trying to suppress his urge to block it. The creature coiled around his neck and the familiar necrotic gas formed around its body as it began to glow green. The necrotic mana of its body mostly left each of its bones, separating from them as it formed an ethereal snake which wrapped around Jay's neck and suddenly disappeared, though Jay could still feel its presence. Huh, but what about the bones? As for its physical bone body, each of the bones were then separated and dispersed on different parts of Jay's clothes, forming a rough sort of armor across the fabric. Jay pursed his lips as he looked at the flimsy bones. It seems kind of pathetic, he thought. He looked like he had covered his clothes in random bits of fish bone, like some kind of crazy homeless man that lived under a bridge. It was obvious to Jay now that he needed some armor, as it made the bones look a bit pathetic clinging onto his tunic. However, with armor they would act as reinforcement. Suddenly, as if responding to his thoughts, the bones all floated once more and gathered around the front of his chest. The bones morphed, squeezed, melded and coalesced, forming a large, round, dark blue amulet with a white chain. That's more like it, huh? Did it read my thoughts? He smiled, then realized he may have offended his unique minion. Oh, sorry. I'm sure it will be good if I got more armor or if you got more bones. We'll get you big and strong in no time. Jay encouraged his new creature. He wasn't sure if it was responding to his thoughts or if this was more like a command from his will. Little did Jay realize, he was beginning to talk to these inanimate constructs as if they were his friends. The dark cobalt blue amulet had the image of a green crossbow bolt on it, and he felt like it was much better looking. 
Nice, he smiled. Now how are you supposed to attack in this form? Suddenly, the ethereal head of the snake reappeared just above his shoulder. Slowly its jaw winded back open to almost a 180 degree angle, and then snapped shut. Oh, a crossbow bolt made purely from necrotic energy, shot out towards a nearby wall of the pyramid at high speed. Wow, Jay raised a brow before grinning, shocked with the speed of the projectile. It even left after images, though that may be due to the necrotic magic which formed the bolt. Seeing the speed, Jay felt like he could kill anything that would try to run from him now. With a shoulder-mounted weapon he felt like some sort of predator. Jay watched with anticipation as the bolt was about to hit the other side of the room, but as it hit the wall, it didn't affect it at all, comma, it simply passed through it. What? Where's the damage? He reread the helmet skill, confirming that it would do 5 damage, comma, but he found that it specified necrotic damage, and quickly he realized that necrotic magic energy probably won't do much against stone comma not to mention that this was a Helvetian pyramid, a cursed land where even the stone statues were immune to magic. I suppose we should test you outside Jay said to his ghostly helmet still. I'm glad I can have you with me secretly, but definitely don't go firing any bolts unless I tell you to. The ethereal skull snapped its jaw, lowered its head and disappeared. Jay felt its energy form snuggle itself back into a ring around his neck. It was weightless, but he could still sense it. He tried to touch it, but his hand simply went through it, and he physically felt nothing. Huh, must be my necromancer senses I guess. He shrugged, knowing the helminth was there even though he couldn't touch it. I suppose it's good that no one can touch you. With nothing left for him in the dungeon, Jay decided to leave. Jay could have remained here longer and accomplished a few various tasks but decided he should attend Villada's lesson. I'll fix the shield later tonight, he thought. Jay knew he wouldn't need the shield in the meantime, and besides, he should be saving at least some of his mana for Villada's lesson. Jay willed to leave the dungeon, and the familiar obelisk rose with a door in it. As Jay left, more adventurers were waiting outside, but Jay ignored them as usual. If people knew I was level 10, they would probably be coming to me for lessons Jay stopped a proud smirk from forming on his face as he walked through the adventurers. Of course, Jay still had the disguise stone activated, making him appear as if he were level 9. Nevertheless, being level 9 at this stage still made him a sort of infamous idol among the low-level adventurers of Losla. The sense of superiority that was created around him even made it hard for some adventurers to approach him, they simply watched in admiration. Hum, I wonder if the disguise stone works in parties. Jay just realized he may be able to party up with other adventurers now, and a fire began to rise in his heart, comma, however, it was quickly stifled. Well, I think the skeletons would probably give it away besides. At this point they will just slow me down and leech my exp. Jay had no reason to party up other than companionship, and he was a loner anyway so he really saw no advantage to running a dungeon with low-level people. He received his first X notification since leaving the dungeon, but he decided to ignore it until he came back later. Now the only reason to party up would be for a harder dungeon that required more people. He would still need his skeletons. Without them, he would be useless in a party, making this option self-defeating. The average adventurer level was around level 6 at this point. More was showing up to the Miss Keat dungeon to test themselves. After having leveled up at the various level 2 dungeons around Losla, a few were even going in solo now similar to Jay, but they would return quite quickly. Most groups had been broken down into pairs of 2 or 3 now. Initially, there were large groups of 5 to 7, but many realized that the X was not that good, and neither were they getting much combat experience, and Jay had unknowingly taught the adventurers of Losla a lesson, comma, sometimes less is more. A few adventurers were even selling charged crystals which they kept from the Carter's Demise dungeon, though not many people were buying them as the statue soldiers of Miss Keep were magic immune. Jay proceeded up the mountain, past the quarry. I wonder what Villada will teach me today. Chapter 104 Hello Margaret J entered the Adventurer Association with a smile. Oh hello, I'll go tell Villada you're back. He should be ready by now. Thanks. J waited patiently in the lobby. Knock knock. Villada. Hello, your star pupil is here. Margaret joked as she entered Villada's office. As she looked towards Villada, he shook his head pursing his lips, while he stared at the black cube on his desk. 
M.H., can he come back later? He asked with a frustrated voice. You've already asked him to come back. I can't send him away again, okay? You're going to get in there and teach him, she said with a commanding yet encouraging voice. Villard sighed. He couldn't argue with the sweet old lady even though he wanted to. Okay, I'll be there in a moment. He waved his hand and Margaret left the room. Damn, this kid has to come right when my cube detects mana again. Villada thought as he watched his cube begin to grow once more. A strange thought came across his mind, but he dismissed it. Hum, no, surely it couldn't be. A strange feeling crept over him though as he thought that perhaps there was a correlation between Jay and the black cube. He shook his head trying to dismiss the thought again, still staring at his cube. Surely not. How far is limb growth? Appendage growth 71% complete. Good, keep it up, Villader said with a smile as he stood up from his desk. He really didn't want to leave, but Sullivan had ordered him to specifically teach Jay, and he simply couldn't refuse. After all, it was Sullivan who allowed Villada to do his experiments without much oversight. Sullivan would only have a problem if there was property damage or injury. No one except Sullivan knew that Villada was conducting dangerous research here, and Villada wished to keep it that way, lest he be hunted down. Villada went into the lobby, finding Jay. He was in quite a hurry because he wanted to get back to his desk to keep analyzing his cube. Jay, let's go. He gestured to the hallway. Jay promptly got up with a nod, deciding not to say anything as it seemed like Villada seemed quite flustered today. Is he annoyed with me? Jay could only wonder. Maybe he was mad that I didn't show up yesterday. Jay could only guess, already assuming it was his fault, a mix of insecurity and narcissism. He decided he would try to learn from Villada as quickly as he could today, as perhaps it would improve his teacher's mood. They entered the training yard at the back of the compound and a new set of target rocks had replaced the old ones. Have a seat, Villada said as he began to float cross-legged. I'm busy so I'll try and make this quick. Two lessons today, comma, detect and medium channeling. Villada checked his notebook before putting them back into his pocket. Dot medium channeling is similar to spell channeling, so we will leave that to last. First up is mana sense. He looked at Jay with a bored expression, clearly not wanting to be here. Mana sense is not sensing mana, but it's using mana to sense other things. It's quite easy to do but requires concentration to keep it active, comma, though. If you train hard and persevere at it, you will be able to keep it active even while you sleep. He continued think of it like another sense. This seems useful, Jay thought, slowly nodding as he listened more attentively. First, I will increase the ambient mana here, he said. Suddenly the mana in the air was dense. To Jay it felt like a small pressure was applied to his mind, though it was a good feeling, like wearing a thick hood on a cold day. Now try to funnel your mana into your mind and outwards, and use that to feel the ambient mana. Jay did as he instructed, and soon he felt it, a strange feeling like there was water around him. He could tell where it was, and where it was flowing. It was like a small sphere of water that he could sense, though it didn't go too far from him. The water feeling extended about two meters away from him. Now, you probably won't be able to sense very far, and that will get better with practice. But the way to sense things is simple, comma, you look for the void. The absence of the feeling, since mana can pass through inanimate objects, it will only tell you the presence of things that are circulating either their own mana or blocking mana which can be anything from mana crystals, certain trees, and of course other adventurers. Now, try to sense me. Villada floated forward towards Jay. After a few minutes Jay finally felt like he stabilized the feeling, and could now try to analyze his surroundings. To Jay, it seemed like there was a hollow gap in the water feeling, and he slowly pointed at Villada. Good, remember to keep practicing this even while you're walking home. Soon you will be able to sense further and will start to do it naturally. I see. Jay decided to keep concentrating, while Villada continued his lesson. Now, I know you're going to want to keep using your mana sense, but I don't want the next lesson to be slow, so just don't. Villada said with a slight smile, knowing exactly what Jay was thinking. He then dispersed the ambient mana so that it would be ever harder for Jay to sense. Jay internally sighed and stopped trying. Now, Villada pulled out a red stick from his inventory and handed it to Jay. Jay analyzed the stick as he grabbed it. Vibrance Wand. Spell Channel Tier 1. 
This stick is similar to the green crystals you will have found in the Carter's Demise dungeon last week. We use it to channel spells. Similar to the spell you learnt last time, you channel your mana into it, comma, except, instead of launching the tooth, the mana exists on the other side, creating the spell effect. You can't use spells that require ingredients with these, but you can increase a spell's potency. Villader began to channel a small spell in his bare hand, a bluish-white arrowhead shape was formed from his mana, which he launched at a target rock. SHH, comma, Dune. The spell created a small shockwave around it as it hit the rock, and a few of the smaller pebbles around the rock's base were pushed away. Next, he took out a second red wand, and began channeling the exact same spell. I'm using the same amount of mana for this. He glanced at J. The bluish-white arrowhead-shaped spell appeared, but this time it seemed to have more defined edges, as if it was more in focus somehow. J could tell with a single look that it was much more threatening now. With a flick of his wrist, Villada released the spell. SHH, Dawn. The spell smashed against the rock, and a small gust of wind was kicked up from it. The pebbles around the base of the rock were all pushed away, and the large target rock was also moved a few centimeters. Jay's mouth was agape from the shocking difference, before a smile began to form on his face. He was excited to try this. Now you try, Villada still seemed bored by comparison. He had done this countless times. It was like he was following a script at this point. Jay was about to channel a spell, but realized his only spell is the Unstable Tooth spell, which requires ingredients. The ingredients being a tooth. Ah, I don't have any spells that. It's okay, just try to push your mana through the wand. When you learn a spell, the same concept will apply. Villada cut him off. Jay lightly frowned as he wanted to learn a spell that only used mana. With a nod, he continued following the instructions. Pushing the mana in his body, he moved it to his hand and then began trying to push it into the wand. But for whatever reason, the mana was not going in. Come on, he thought, trying to push harder as he clenched his teeth. His hand started to shake his body and mind was telling him to drop the wand. But he kept fighting it. Though it was like an invisible barrier was around the wand. It really did not want anything to do with Jay's mana. Stop. Villada said, seeing Jay struggle. Jay stopped immediately and looked up at Villada who had a confused expression. It's not letting me push mana into it. It's like a shield is blocking me. Hum Villada took the wand from Jay's hand and repeated his spell. It's fine, there's nothing wrong with the wand. He thought, before turning to Jay to explain. Usually, the wands pull your mana into itself. Mana actually prefers to travel through these objects. He looked puzzled, I don't understand. Chapter 105. Jay couldn't use spell channels, and Villada realized Jay's mana was different. He decided he would test something. Hum, he scratched his chin, staring at Jay. It was quite a long stare. So Jay looked away after feeling a little awkward. Show me that spell you did. The one with the tooth. Jay nodded taking out a tooth. He channeled it like usual and aimed at a rock. All while Villada continued to stare at Jay and his hand. Boom dot flit 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 flit. A crack formed on the rock as the unstable tooth spell exploded. And little bits of its shrapnel were sent everywhere. Creating more gashes on other nearby rocks. Jay looked up expecting some praise since his spell was clearly much stronger, now that it was level 2, but he saw Villada staring at his hand with a creepy look. Obviously, Villada was deep in thought. Jay couldn't tell, but Villada was still analyzing Jay's spell hand. Villada. MMH he didn't respond with more than a grunt, only rolling his tongue in his cheek and squinting as he thought about what to do. Why can't I sense his mana he thought to himself with a furrowed brow. Usually there is some residual mana after a person makes it their own. But with him, there is none at all. Usually when someone activates a spell, there would be some ambient mana mixed in too. Could it be due to his monster class? Suddenly, Villada had an idea. He put away the red wands and pulled out something quite different. The wand was some sort of stone. It was black, thin, and had a hoop at one end. It looked like a stone spoon with a hole in it, completely useless for soup. Halfway down the shaft, numerous tiny bones and feathers were tied around in one spot, with a single leather binding, forming a band which made Jay think it was used for some sort of dark, barbaric woodland magic. At the very bottom was a crude-looking metal hook, probably used to rip out more of those tiny bones, thought Jay. He was unable to identify the bones, but guessed that they probably came from bat wings or rat legs, 
simply too skinny to be something like finger bones. Villada held it in his hand and gazed at it for a moment. It was like he was suspicious of it. But after a moment he held it out to Jay. Here, try this he looked at it mysteriously as he handed it to Jay. Jay reached out and grabbed it, immediately analyzing it. Goblin Wand Taken from a goblin shaman, often kept as trophies as they serve no purpose to humans and the like. It doesn't say spell channel though. Just try it, Villada said bluntly. Jay closed his eyes and began the process again, comma gathering mana into his hand and pushing it into the wand. This time, it felt much different. As the mana coursed towards his hand, the wand seemed to suck it from his hand into itself. It was like the wand was magnetized and greedily gobbled up Jay's mana. He didn't even need to try. After a moment, a small black orb began to appear in the center of the hoop. In the middle of the wand, more feathers began to grow under the tiny bones, pushing out the old ones. The new feathers were black, while the old ones were a mix of yellow and rustic red. Jay continued to push his mana into his hand until he felt that the wand finally stopped absorbing it. Villada stood idly by, but as soon as the black orb appeared his eyes widened. Jay looked up at him, raising a brow at Villada's expression, comma, who quickly changed his face back to his usual expression of detached aloofness, and cleared his throat. It seems like you can only channel through monster wands. Monster wands. The spell channels that monsters use, they're different to ours, since monster mana is different also, comma, monsters convert mana into a different form. It results in them casting spells without much effort but they also require different tools. As you know, monsters aren't the smartest, so their spells are more instinctive as is their mana. Their spells are more powerful, and they never need to practice to get stronger, or at least they never think to practice. He continued we can get stronger than them, and evolve our spells through practice and testing however, giving us an advantage in the long term. So that's why the red wand didn't work. That's why I can use a goblin wand even though it doesn't say it can be used as a spell channel. Yes, I think so. The goblins use those wands as spell channels. But it doesn't actually tell us it's a spell channel. Because we simply can't use them as such. Or at least other humans cannot. The system assumes we don't receive monster classes. Villada shrugged. A mischievous smile appeared on Jay's face as he realized something. So I both have the stronger instinctive mana and can also practice and test spells. Villada now realized the implications of this too. Yes, he smiled helplessly as he shook his head. You can keep the goblin wand, he added. It's useless to me, in fact. You can probably purchase much better ones for a much cheaper price, since they're useless to normal people. Awesome. I'll have to stop by Lillian. Jay smiled. To anyone else, this would have been quite a shocking discovery, but Villada still had his cube sitting on his desk. It was growing while he was teaching, and it made everything else fade into the background, irrelevant. Well, those are the lessons for today. See you in a week. He walked towards the door in the back of the association. Oh, and come back tomorrow. I want to test something. He said just before he slipped inside through the door. Jay nodded while he was still sitting there, looking at his new toy with a grin. I can't wait to learn a spell. Hum, my helminth has a spell. Maybe I can copy it. He wondered as he gazed at the tiny black orb. After a moment, the orb dissipated into tiny ripples in the air as it disappeared. Jay was about to bring out his bone helminth. But first he looked around cautiously, then decided it may not be the safest place to bring out the parasitic undead worm. Creature, comma, especially without Villada, who would be able to sense if people were coming. I wonder if Villada can sense it when it's underground, Jay thought, wondering how far someone like Villada could extend his mana sensibility. Perhaps if it's deep underground he will just think it's some sort of natural creature. Villada had already left by now, so Jay decided to check next time. The sentinel form of the worm summon skill said it was undetectable while it was hiding as an amulet around his neck, and Jay had successfully confirmed this, comma, Villada and Margaret didn't say anything while he walked into the association with it. So it was clear that its presence was completely erased. Now that Jay had some time to think, he addressed another matter that he had left till later. Now I was saving a skill point until I got to level 10. I can't use it for any of my new passive skills or the helminth, so I guess I will put it into either Undead Mastery or the Raise skill. Ah 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 ah. Suddenly, his stomach grumbled. Hum, I will consider where to put it after visiting Lillian and getting some lunch. 
Jay stood up and stretched his legs before heading back inside. Hopefully Lillian has some monster wands here at Losler, otherwise I will have to wait for them to be delivered. Jay headed straight to the trading area. Chapter 106 Human Kingdom of Estrata, City of Redfall, the Royal Castle, comma. Somewhere in the labyrinth of tunnels under the Royal Castle, a cry incessantly wailed out. Screams of pain echoed out that seemed to make the air colder. The prophet said the necromancer would come from inside our own kingdom. A man in thick segmented dark grey stone armor. Said to eight others wearing the same type of armor. Division 1, you will search north. Division 2, northeast he continued until he sent Division 8 to the northwest of the kingdom. One of the commanders stepped forward. He had something to say. You, what is it? The burly man pointed at the one who stepped out of line, questioning him with the rough gravelly voice of a war-torn veteran. Colonel he saluted the northeast is in a state of war. Any traces of a necromancer will be found by the army. He then lowered his head and stepped back into line. The large colonel squinted at the Division 2 commander for a moment before he thought to himself. He just doesn't want to deploy. I won't let him get out of it that easily. The colonel thought for a moment and decided to change a few orders around. Division 4, you will search the southwest of the kingdom with Division 5. Division 2, you will instead search the south. The southwest is large, consisting of farmland, forests, rivers and mountains, so two divisions is ideal. He smiled, knowing that the commander of Division 2 will now have the whole south area to search and monitor. The Division 2 commander nodded without a word. He had his orders, it was his duty to follow them. Look for any reports of peasants being killed, and search for anything odd. A necromancer is a powerful being. It won't take long to see villages laid to waste. Hopefully we can kill it before it grows too strong. Eight divisions of the mage hunters were being dispatched from the capital. A huge move as this consisted of most of the mage hunters, leaving only two divisions to defend the capital. Of course. The military would still be there, comma, the mage hunters were more of an elite secret intelligence service by comparison. After the prophecy, the prophet was tortured for any more information he may secretly be withholding out of spite, and now the search for the necromancer had started, comma, of course. None of them realized yet that the necromancer in question is indeed a human, an S-class variant. Each division of mage hunters were 400 strong, and every single soldier in their ranks were a force to be reckoned with, each one of them well equipped to deal with mages of all sorts. Their dark grey armor had anti-magic properties which could be activated or deactivated, and each of them purpose made to deal with the most troublesome of magic variants. The armor featured support systems such as vital, psych, hex and mana monitors, which would inject the wearer with a variety of cocktails to either simply heal them, or even to counter the psychoactive mana effects of sickly love magic. There was even an elixir made to block dimension practitioners from forming portals around the mage hunter. An internal emergency air supply was recently added after an elite Dimikin assassin named Kriege laid waste to an entire scouting party of the mage hunters without much effort whatsoever. Their magic was air-based however, not even one of the illegal types. All of these armors came inbuilt with an auto-destruct mechanism which upon death of its user would trigger. After all, it would be a disaster if an enemy of the kingdom got hold of one of these armors and extracted its many secrets, learning of its mana support system capabilities or its anti-magic properties. Many times, these armors were employed in the ongoing war and they regularly turned the tides of battle. The only way to deal with these was with proficient melee class troops. And even then, most of their powerful abilities would simply not work against these dark grey suits. Due to the material they were made from they could not be repaired, and most of the armors had dents, chips and scratches that had built up over time, making each one of their wearers seem like rugged, dangerous veterans of unending walls. Any questions? The burly man asked. But it seemed more like a statement that one should not answer. None of the commanders said anything. You're dismissed. His figure instantly blurred and disappeared from the room, teleported away. With their orders laid out for them, each of them went off to their divisions, finding their captains to make their respective battalions ready to move out. Within each 400 strong battalion there were two companies, and in each company were four platoons. Within the platoons were five squads, consisting for ten hunters each. This is a recruitment mission. The primary target is a necromancer who could have massive implications for our future. You're coming for security and nothing else. Lannister said as he put emphasis on the words nothing else. K. 
Can't we just grab the targets and leave? Laura asked in a bored tone. No, we have orders to convince, not coerce. We will need him as an ally. Besides, he's going to be a student here, not a prisoner now. If there's no more questions, then get ready. The portal is going to open soon. Lannister said abruptly and to the point. He was not going to let Lara come along for a good time. South of Losla, a glowing blue dot suddenly appeared in the quiet of the forest. From a single point, it began to grow as it was filled with volatile energy and flashed, quickly turning into a vertical line, while air began to swell around it. Dancing leaves rustled on the forest floor as they began to get caught up in the small whirlwind being created. Faster and faster the line of energy swelled and crackled, until a bulge formed in the center of it. Blue zaps of energy radiated and flashed from it as the bulge got larger and pushed as it turned, slowly forming into a spindle shape of menacing energy. Before suddenly it burst into a circle shape, with a flat mirror at the center inside. The coursing blue energy was pushed to the outside, forming a threatening crackling circle around it. Suddenly, the mirror rippled as a man's head poked through. He turned and looked around, scanning the environment for any threats or witnesses, before retreating into the mirror again. The portal floated silently for a moment in the middle of the quiet forest. After a moment, the mirror rippled again as a man stepped through completely, followed by a woman Lara. Both of them were wearing typical civilian clothes, though each had matching green capes with hoods. This is it. That must be the dungeon over there. Lannister pointed to the stink rat marsh. I'm not looking forward to traveling back through that. Lara said, pursing her lips as she looked at the swamp water puddle. Don't complain. Lannister said coldly, Losla should be north of here. Let's do some scouting and make sure this isn't a trap before we find Sullivan. Lara nodded, suddenly becoming professional as they both began to creep north through the quiet forest. The portal collapsed behind them, turning back into a single dot, and then disintegrating into a ripple in the air. Residual, visible blue particles of concentrated mana dispersed into nothingness, as if they were never there to begin with. Chapter 107 Jay touched the wall-mounted trade crystal with a large grin, excited to see what he could find on the market. Perhaps he could find the most powerful monster one for only a few gold. Maybe they would be seen as trash that weren't even worth picking up. Who knows? Trade platform accessed. 29 minutes remaining. Jay sat down on a nearby bench before he began to search through the items. There were a few other adventurers around now that they could start selling their loot and buying things. Though many of them did not look as cheery as Jay did, they didn't have a monster class. So at this point, they were stressing over every single gold coin. One even had to get up from the bench and touch the trade crystal again. Jay shook his head pitying them before he opened the trade window. Hum I'll start with searching wand, but how will I know it's a monster wand? What if I buy some expensive crap I can't even use? Jay found his first problem, but hoped that the monster wands would have obvious names, such as the goblin wand. A long list of wands came up, and soon he found the one he used in Villader's class. Vibrance wand. Spell channel tier 1. 110. Gold. Wow, that was an expensive wand. I had no clue spell channels were so expensive. Jay searched for his green crystals that he previously harvested from the Carter's Demise dungeon, only to find that the price was still around 0.7 gold. What? Why? But it's a spell channel too. He was confused, he felt like he got ripped off comma, but this was the price available to everyone. So how could he complain? What he now wanted to know was why was a tier 1 spell channel item priced differently. He decided to not let this one go, immediately he wanted an answer. Jay got up from his seat and knocked on the window door to Lillian's office. He heard a sigh come from behind the door as she sluggishly got up before walking across and opening the window in the door. Hello again, how can I help you today? She said with a sarcastic tone. I was wondering why a tier 1 spell channel is priced differently from another. Shouldn't they be the same? A tier 1 spell channel. Can you give me more information? A verbance wand is 110 gold, while a minor green crystal is 0.7 gold. They're both tier 1 spell channels, so I was one dash. Oh, Lillian cut Jay off with a smile. Minor crystals shatter after some use. Their shape also results in only slightly stronger spells. Most only use them for alchemy ingredients. Oh, I see. Thanks. Is there anything else? Lillian smiled as she shut the window, not even listening to Jay's answer. 
And dash he turned around as the window shut and walked back to the bench no thanks. He went back into the trade platform, doing a wand search again. He found the goblin wand. Goblin wand. Trophy. 46. Gold. Oh, this is actually pretty expensive. Jay thought Villada's pretty generous I guess. He was starting to appreciate Villada now, despite his frustrated attitude from his class. Huh, it's in a trophy category. So I guess most monster drops like this would be there. Jay browsed the other ones for a moment that came up in the search. But he really was out of his depth. And none of them really piqued his interest. There were hundreds of wands, most of them expensive. And with strange names that he had never heard of. Klonskich one heinous screamer wand Abathis one charmer's one hatecraft wand. Jay did scroll past a few that had trophy and sounded like they belonged to monsters. But they were either cheaper than Jay's or incredibly expensive. This was when Jay realized a second problem. Checking the prices, he realized that these would have their value determined by how good they were to look at. The price had no bearing on if they worked well or not, no human could test them. Perhaps a rare but beautiful wand may belong to an illusive low level creature, making the wand a collector's item and raising its value. Practically though, the wand could be useless. It seems like trophies are something only the nobles would buy too. Damn it, this just gets more complicated. He frowned slightly, his grin long gone. Jay then decided to search by category and brought up the trophy listings. Similar to the ones, there were hundreds, maybe thousands. The list seemed to go on and on. Jay had to scroll through for five minutes before finding a wand, water hoplite wand, though it was incredibly expensive. This is when he realized another problem too. A spell channel doesn't necessarily have to be a wand. The crystal he had was a spell channel, and it wasn't a wand. Surely there were other monster drops that no one knew were spell channels. Frustrated, Jay let out a long sigh. Seems like I have wasted this trip. He thought as he closed the trade window, a defeated frown on his face. There were simply too many unknowns. Besides, Jay doesn't want to risk his hard-earned money on something that will make spell casting deadlier, especially since he doesn't have any spells in the first place. Not to mention he already had the expensive goblin wand. With a defeated frown he shut the trade window, glad that he had at least one monster wand. It will be enough for now he pursed his lips as he got up and left the trade area. By Margaret J smiled as he left the association, and a warm smile returned back to him as he passed by. Jay paused for a moment as he watched a few adventurers run in and out of the association. Most of them had sold the overpriced weapons they bought from Bertram by now, as they discovered the trade room in the guild. Of course, some would bitter since no one told them about the trade area. They brought their sour attitudes to the trade area too now, which had made Lillian fairly bothered. But it was not her job to babysit them. It was quite a harsh lesson to learn at such a low level. But it would help in the long term after all. It was almost like a rite of passage now. A tradition. Jay watched some train in the courtyard. Testing their new purchases. Some wielded spears with scales and jagged edges. Others carried bows with feathers and spikes. Slowly but surely the adventurers of Losla were getting stronger. While the average adventurer level was still 6. Many were now hitting level 7. And some of the hardest working adventurers were even level 8. Compared to most of the other villages in the region, Losla was an anomaly, comma, other villages were still averaging around level 4. It didn't stand out too much now, but if this continued, it would attract attention, and not necessarily the good kind. Unbeknownst to Jay, this was because of him. His incessant rushing around, leaving dungeons early in the mornings, being high level, combined with going into dungeons solo, had an impact on the local adventurer community which made them push themselves harder. Anya was one of the few who touched on level 8 now, and she only worked harder, seeing that she was one level behind Jay, who was level 9 comma as the guild master's daughter. She was not isolated from the gossip going around. Anya was even copying Jay and going into dungeons solo, though sometimes she would form a duo team with various tank class adventurers, a few people she trusted comma they could block the damage, while she would deal it. Of course, Jay is level 10, his disguised stone doing the perfect job of hiding this fact. Now that ability point I was saving from level 9, do I want another level 3 skeleton? Or all of them to be level 4? He thought as he watched the training dummies and wooden target birds being decimated by their new weapons. Chapter 108 
Jay was deciding where to put his skill point as he watched adventurers training in the association courtyard. Grrrr. Dunk. Two tanks charged and bashed against each other with their new shields. The sturdy iron walls making a deep ringing sound after the impact. It seemed like they were getting some sort of enjoyment out of it which Jay didn't seem to understand. Fuck yeah. One shouted jubilantly. Flet flet flet. Another adventurer unleashed an ultra rapid volley of tiny bolts from a wrist mounted crossbow. Hitting three of the magic wooden birds as they flapped about. I wonder how much damage those do seems like a waste of bolts. Perhaps if they aimed it at a creature's eyes, it would be good. Thought Jay as he watched before going back to his own business. Hum I suppose it will take even more time for the skeletons to hit level 4. Since you need more experience per level. I guess it would be better to get them started now. Besides, I'm already at a much higher level than them. Dot dot and I do have another undead companion now. Jay smiled to himself as he touched the amulet on his chest. It also seems like most of the adventurers have a party size of at most 5 too. So I probably have a good amount of skeletons for now. He thought, watching the adventurers going in and out of the association, he still didn't realize that the unspoken limit of 5 was because of him. Going solo into dungeons and being high level changed the mindset of the other adventurers. Clearly he was doing something right, right. With a nod, he wasted no more time, putting another skill point into Undead Mastery. Undead Mastery level 3, passive. Your undead can reach a max level of comma 4 level up as permanent. Current levels. 3. Now all I have to do is wait Jay smiled gleefully. I wonder if they will need more food. Next, Jay was going to decide if he should head home or travel back to the Miskeet dungeon. However, as he looked up there was a young girl standing in front of him. Neria. He smiled. She didn't say anything but smiled back slightly, staring into his eyes full of wonderment. Jay wasn't experienced with kids, so he couldn't think of what to say, especially since she wasn't saying anything either. You look healthy. He patted her head. I hope you're taking good care of Margaret and the other adventurers. He smiled and soon received a toothy grin back. Jay was glad she was smiling now at least. When she first saw Jay, he seemed like a monster, and to Jay, she seemed helpless as she shivered in the back of that cupboard. Her only defense was clinging more lightly to her water bottle. Alright, I have monsters to slay and people to save, so I need you to stay here and protect the association. He smiled warmly at her as he crouched down. Neria made a serious face and nodded as she held her tiny fist up, accepting her role as the protector of the guild. Good girl. Jay smiled, almost chuckling at her antics. He gave her one more head pat before leaving. He felt uncomfortable around children as he didn't know what to say, so he made himself scarce. As a lone butcher, he was all business. Usually he only talked to others about what he practically did, which would probably not be very relevant to a young child. Now, home or dungeon, Jay considered his next steps for a moment. He would still be leveling if he went home, but he wanted to explore more of the dungeon and reach the next pyramid, comma, perhaps even clear it. Unfortunately, his new creature's necrotic bolts would be useless against the statues, but this only spurred another idea of Jay's. He would not let the bone helmet be idle, comma, it would be a waste after all. After some thought, Jay decided to head to the wolf's quarry dungeon. While it was a level 5 dungeon, it would of course be much harder to navigate, and have a higher max level of monsters in it, comma, however, Jay had only just played around on the tip of the iceberg of this dungeon, and had only faced monsters around level 5. There were still many more secrets to unlock in Wolf's Quarry, but Jay decided he would clear the Miskeet dungeon first. He thought it was even a little pathetic that he had only cleared one dungeon completely at this point, comma, the level 1 Stink Rat Marsh. Compared to the Stink Rat Marsh and the Miskeet, the quarry was more complex. It was like a bitter, dark, ravenous hole, filled with winding branching passages, and complete with sneak attacks. It was like the dungeon itself wanted its trespassers to suffer in its bowels, their screams leaving behind only soft echoes on the wind. Jay now had one advantage, comma, a creature which could travel underground. It could easily pop out of the ground, attack a silt wolf and hide in the earth again, shielded from any retaliation. The Helminth would have free reign of the dungeon, comma, the only limiting factor to its success would be that its necrotic bolts take time to recharge. 
But why would Jay care about that? The parasitic worm was not doing much at the moment anyway, as it lazily wrapped around Jay's neck. Each silt wolf had 40 health, while the worm carried 5 bolts, each doing 5 damage apiece. 25 damage total. After a wolf is brought down to 15 health, it would need 3 more bolts to finish it, though each new bolt needed 300 seconds to generate. In total, 15 minutes to regenerate to require 3 bolts, along with the time it takes to attack a wolf. Hum, I think it would be about 20 to 30 minutes for the worm to kill one. Not bad for a level 1 creature, he smiled. Not bad at all. It was overpowered for level 1, but it was a special companion skill for a necromancer. Naturally, it would be deadly. Then it can gather the blue bones for me too. It's always good having more. He shrugged. Jay proceeded to the wolf's quarry dungeon with a light jog. He wanted the hunting to get started as soon as possible. Finally he made it to the fake mining site. Getting inside the dungeon, he floated down once more. Into the darkness, he soon found the mining campsite with the single lamp, though he didn't bother to pick it up. Now natural form, he said to his helminth. The ethereal creature glowed and detached from Jay's neck, seemingly squirming through the air. It became visible again. Next his amulet floated and began breaking apart, growing and unwrapping popping and snapping. The bones slowly emerged from it one by one, somehow in perfect condition even after the transformation. The bones floated and lined up with the floating ghostly helminth before clicking and sucking into place. Sure enough, its skeletal body wriggled and began to move. After its completion it stopped floating and plopped on the ground, coiling into a circle and lifting its head up to its master trying to guess Jay's motives. Jay crouched down to talk to it, staring into its solid green eyes. I want silf wolf bones, he said quietly. The creature snapped its jaws and dived into the earth, swimming through the dirt covertly as it approached its first target. Just as enthusiastic as the skeletons smiled Jay, happy with its performance. He willed to leave the dungeon, and just before he exited he heard the wailing howl of a wolf, a whimper of pain. It must be pretty fast underground. He chuckled as he found himself on the surface again. I wonder if I should name it. But what would I even call it? What to call an undead parasitic worm? Snaky. Wormy. Squiggly boy. Sir Noodle. Limp dick. He suddenly had a cheeky grin on his face. Anya would definitely kill me if she found out that I called it limp dick. Perhaps most people would. He chuckled. That's probably a bigger offense than what being a necromancer is. A part of him wanted to call it Mr. Wiggle. But he decided he should actually give it a decent name this time. The parasitic worm was one of a kind after all. And while it would be hilarious to Jay, it seemed like the worm was much more intuitive than his skeletons. Much more lifelike, almost like it had a personality. It also was a great little helper and was physically close to Jay, nursing itself around his neck to protect its master. Jay valued its sense of love mixed in with its undying loyalty. Yes, he valued it, and a strange part of him wanted to pet it, even though its head was a smooth, slender bone of a warped soap rat skull. He shook his head, getting rid of his smile. I'll give it more thought. It deserves a good name. Next Jay headed back to the miskeep dungeon. He decided to start practicing the mana sense ability as he walked. At first he had to stand still to activate it, but after a while, he was able to slowly take a step forward. After a while he got more used to the feeling and soon walked forward slowly, while keeping it activated. Soon enough, he was walking nearly at normal pace again, comma, though he did feel himself getting mentally drained as his mana was being depleted. It was like a large weight on his concentration. Unfortunately, Jay still had not gotten a notification from the system that he has learnt the mana sense skill, so it seemed like it would require much more practice from him. Oh, well he stopped trying and started a light jog to the miskeep dungeon. I wonder what the third pyramid has in store for me. Chapter 109 As Jay arrived at the miskeep dungeon there were adventurers out the front like usual. But Jay still didn't see Stephen this time. This caused him to smile. And the atmosphere even seemed more positive without that guy here. Most adventures didn't approach Jay now. They realized it was pointless to try and recruit him into their parties. But many still looked with gawking expressions, still shocked that Jay was level 9. Jay passed by them as usual without saying a word. But he noticed that the group sizes were much smaller now, with the majority of adventurers in parties of 2 or 3. There were not even any parties of 5 anymore. Huh, I guess 3 must be the ideal number, thought Jay as he walked past quietly. 
This party size served the adventurers of Losler well, because now the more experienced duos were taking in lower level people and helping them to level up as a trio. The majority had melee base classes too, and they were finding that the ideal party structure consisted of two melee, with either one ranged or one mana. At least for now it was ideal anyway, as the higher level dungeons sometimes required small armies of men, blacksmiths, hospitals, mess halls inside fortified base camps, were constructed in such dungeons being necessary to conquer them. Of course, the rewards would similarly reflect such grand efforts. Just before Jay entered the level 3 dungeon, he saw a familiar face Komaranya. He simply nodded and was going to walk past, not desiring to talk with her. Hey Jay, she said placidly. He wasn't sure if it was a greeting or a question. Hi Anya, he said as he continued to walk by here. Some other adventurers began to watch the exchange. The level 9 Jay was actually talking to someone. Wow, he just acknowledged her. Look someone said quietly from the crowd. It's the guildmaster's daughter. He basically has two. Another whispered back. Anya wanted to ask Jay something, and the next thing Anya said seemed like it was hard to say, but she squeezed it out nonetheless. I'm level 8 now, want to party up. Jay finally stopped walking, and a mischievous smile formed on his face as he turned to her. With me. Are you sure this is what Sullivan wants? He teased her. Anya said bluntly no, I would just like to see how far we can get. She pursed her lips. As the guildmaster's daughter, she was supposed to be the highest level adventurer. People were supposed to be asking her to party with them. She had trained diligently in the guild all her life, and now some butcher was easily a higher level. She had to restrain her pride as she asked Jay. Of course he had a monster class, but this didn't factor into Anya's thought pattern. Hum, okay, but this isn't a free ride. Jay slightly smiled, he had tested her pride, and she came out humble. Anya rolled her eyes. I'm quite capable, you'll see. Jay was actually happy to have her helping. The third pyramid was next, and he wouldn't mind some help. The second pyramid would have gone much more smoothly with her there. I forget how to invite someone thought Jay, feeling a little awkward comma but thankfully he received a notification before anyone realized. Party invitation comma Anya. Accept slash decline. Jay decided to collect his experience points before partying up comma just in case he had to share it. 620 x. Good he thought his productive minions were diligent as always. Except thought Jay as he formed a party with her once more. You are now the party leader. Anya made him the leader meaning he would now be the only one able to invite others. It was practically pointless but among adventurers it was an unspoken sign of respect. Thanks. Let's quickly enter the dungeon, he said, before she had a chance to check anything. Jay wasn't sure if the disguised stone worked well in a party, and if she knew that he was level 10, there was a small chance she would blurt it out in surprise, so he wanted to quickly enter. Wow, he actually partied up with someone, did you see that? One of the lower level adventurers spoke loudly enough for others to hear. I guess he isn't always solo, another said, slightly surprised. In Losler, most people thought that perhaps Jay was going solo for popularity or fame. So after some adventurers saw this, it made him seem like he was being fake. People built up an idea about Jay in their heads that bear no resemblance to reality. It was purely assumption. Anya would get more popular after this, as she was the only one Jay had partied up with so far. Of course, Jay had no idea about any of this and neither would he care about it. He was solely focused on getting stronger and learning his respective craft common necromancy. Anya obliged with a serious nod, and quickly walked to the dungeon behind Jay. Clearly what Jay said about her pulling her weight, had brought out her professional side, and she was not going to be a burden. To any adventurer this would be a massive opportunity to party up with the one who was the highest level. Entering the dungeon, Jay found himself at the second pyramid. Huh, he wondered. Last time he came here, he would always end up at the start of the dungeon. Perhaps it's because I conquered the pyramid. But hum, I guess I didn't technically conquer the first pyramid, as Sedulous is still alive. Anya looked around, gasping as her eyes widened. Where are we? How much of this dungeon have you done? She quickly whispered. This is the second pyramid. Jay said leisurely, as he seemed a little distracted. I need the skeletons to bring the soul stones back here, if there are any. 
He willed through his mental connection to his skeletons, ignoring Anya who was still looking around gawking. Jay still needed a little under 300 regular soul stones to complete his quest as well as the two greater ones. He could sense that his minions weren't too far away now because of necrotic sense, and one of them had been tasked by Blue to bring the soul stones back to him. The second pyramid, Anya finally said, shocked. No one had even conquered the first pyramid yet even with larger parties. It was simply a labyrinth with too many traps. Let me guess, you walked around the first one. Nope. Jay smiled smugly. Seriously. She had a look of disbelief on her face. You did it solo too. Technically he didn't conquer the first pyramid. But he didn't let the truth ruin a good story. Jay only nodded in response as he looked towards the entrance of the pyramid comma he already answered her question. There was no point saying yes again. No exit opened up behind the stone throne. So they would need to backtrack. Anya read his body language and took out her crossbow. Clearing the shock out of her system and getting ready. She decided in her mind that she would not be a hindrance to Jay. Let's move. Jay said, heading back towards the entrance of the pyramid through the circles of light. Anya tried to hide her smile as she stepped over the large toppled statues, a sign of a fierce past battle. One statue was completely unidentifiable, but she could tell that it was huge, even though all that remained now was dust pebbles and rubble. She hadn't stepped foot inside this pyramid yet, so she was trying to study everything. It seemed like a simple pyramid by the looks of it. There were no trap doors or winding twists and turns. So she didn't bother to ask Jay for any tips about it, comma, of course. This was a huge mistake. As Jay exited the pyramid, the black highway came into view, comma, filled with more rubble of past battles. A fire was slowly rising inside Anya's belly, as she could only imagine fighting through these blockades of stone statues. The giant pillars on each side only made it seem like the battle was that much more glorious. Just the sight made her feel energized, roaring for battle. Suddenly, Anya crouched on one knee and aimed at something approaching them. It was coming at high speed. She had to act fast. Wait. Jay held his hand up, knowing what she was aiming at. Jay's skeleton, Sweeper, was bringing him a soul stone as it dashed through the ruined city and over destroyed buildings. 17.5 x 17.5 x. The other three skeletons killed two more statues as they waited. Jay was only getting half as much exp now that Anya was here. He didn't mind it too much as he got plenty of exp while he slept anyway. The real problem for Jay was when it came to the boss fights, Jay would need more firepower, and the skeletons just didn't quite cut it. Anya however had a different reaction to the free experience. She had only been in this dungeon for 10 minutes. And already it was like they killed two statues, comma, though. Neither had done so much as lift a finger in battle. She was trying to hide her shock, and a small part of her felt like she owed Jay something. Chapter 110. Since the second pyramid had no passage through it, they now had to walk around. Alright. We're going to head to the third pyramid. I'll bring the skeletons back so we can push safely together. Jay said leisurely. Sounds like a plan. Anya followed his lead. Jay commanded his skeletons to come back to him, but he kept Sweeper out there, collecting the soul stones of the statues the skeletons slayed, while he was in lessons with Villada. Thankfully, the skeletons had cleared most of the statues this way, so there was not much of a hindrance to their journey comma apart from the old piece of rubble on the ruined city roads. The skeletons sprinted back as a group, and Anya hadn't seen them for a while, so she stopped for a moment to watch them. As the skeletons had returned back, they began walking ahead of Jay and Anya, functioning as the vanguard of the party. Wow, they're all as big as blue now. Anya commented as the three skeletons returned. Yeah, and they're only level 3 Jay smiled, knowing that soon enough they will be level 4, and probably look even more threatening. Anya remembered the power that blue exhibited by itself during the leech incident. She shook her head, speechless. Jay's personal bodyguards were simply too strong. As they walked, the silence started to feel awkward, so Jay made some more conversation. By the way, you can see my level in the party, right? Yes, level 9 necromancer. Okay, just checking. Jay tried to sound casual, stopping himself from smiling as he was level 10. The disguised stone even works in parties. 
He shook his head in disbelief and sedulous said there were no treasures here. He thought as he walked along silently, internally though he was cheering. Jay began to notice a difference between himself and Anya as they walked. He traveled much more casually than Anya, and much more loudly too. Sometimes he even got bored and kicked a rock or two. Anya, however, was constantly scanning the environment. She was quite tense by comparison. Her eyes darted left and right, while each of her steps were silent, not making a sound. Jay appreciated her professional attitude, but felt like she was being way too serious. All they were doing was walking after all. Relax a bit, you're making me nervous. Jay chuckled with a light smile. Anya pursed her lips for a moment and nodded as she lowered her crossbow a little. Sorry. This is all new territory for me. It's okay, me too. Don't worry though, the skeletons will do most of the fighting. I'll tell you when they need some help. At the moment, they can all keep one preoccupied without taking damage. Or take a statue down, but suffer a few hits in return. Anya rolled her tongue in her cheek as she thought for a moment. So you can keep four preoccupied at once. Since it seems like you have four skeletons now. Or do you have more? Yep. Four. I only have four for now. I see she looked at the skeletons with their hammers. I wonder how powerful Jay is now. She thought silently as she walked, realizing he could probably take on a group of five statues without much effort. Soon enough they made it around the second pyramid without incident, and were well on their way to the third. Another black highway stretched out before them, yet there were no pillars on either side and no military blockades either comma though there was a rhythmic thumping sound that steadily grew louder as they approached. Finally, they saw their first group of enemies, a party of five stone soldiers marched in unison, three of them were spearmen, while two were swordsmen. These were not the only group however, as further behind them another group marched endlessly, in total there were five groups of enemies, all marching in unison, as if they were perfectly disciplined soldiers. As Jay and Anya stepped onto the highway, they received a message. Entrance challenge. Reset area. If you leave the area, enemies will be reset. A reset area. Huh, he watched the soldiers march up and down the highway for a moment. What if I just decide to skip it? Jay mischievously smiled as he gazed into the distance and looked at the pyramid. Damn, seems like the door is shut. I guess that's why it's called an entrance challenge. Instead of military blockages. These groups of the powerful stone statues marched back and forward along the highway, each stern and threatening, as each heavy footstep made a thudding sound, while they marched in perfect harmony. Jay watched for a moment before realizing the difficulty of this challenge. While each group of statues consisted of three spearmen and two swordsmen, that wasn't what necessarily made it difficult, comma, in fact, to Jay, this was a piece of cake. What made it hard was the marching comma if they didn't kill a group of five statues fast enough, another one would show up. For instance, if they only killed four statues, and five more showed up, they would then be dealing with six statues. Dealing with six would be much harder too, as it would then be a six versus six battle, slowing down their killing speed. If they killed three, then five more showed up, they would then be facing eight. Soon another group of five would show up, and slowly they would be overwhelmed. Everything depended on the first battle, otherwise it would get exponentially harder. If they retreated from the area they would live, but the statues would be reset and come back to life, meaning they would have to try again. Hum, it's almost like a miniature dungeon. He thought as he scratched his chin before turning to Anya. We will have to kill them fast, otherwise we will need to retreat and try again. Jay accurately analyzed the situation. MN. Anya nodded in agreement, already understanding the gist of the situation. Let's back off for a bit. I need to repair my shield before I'll be ready. Then as soon as Sweeper returns we can start. Are you prepared? Yeah. Yes. Anya said as she looked over her crossbow and checked some things in her inventory and her waist. She was ready since they entered. Since they last met, Anya had upgraded her crossbow to one which was larger and more sturdy now. It had two light blue rails that the bolt slipped in between, as well as a foot handle on the front. The crossbow was thicker and packed a bigger punch, and the foot handle was necessary from the sheer power of the crossbow. It also allowed faster reloading, as now two hands could be used to pull the drawstring back. Anya's bolts received an upgrade as well, each of them were longer to fit the larger bow and had thicker tips made from a type of hardened steel. 
On various parts of her light leather armor were small throwing knives for easy access and situational use. Jay had looked at it a few times. He wondered what the light blue rails were for. Perhaps they are some kind of charging or imbuing mechanism. He thought as he looked at it. Obviously it was one of those powerful items that Sullivan would have gifted her. Jay and Anya stepped off the highway so that they didn't start the first battle and hid safely in some nearby ruins. Jay took out the three pieces of his shield. He wasn't sure how to fix it, so it was really a guessing game at this point. Sitting down, he began the repair process. He pushed the three parts together and added some necrotic mana to it. Green gas swirled around it for a moment. But nothing happened, though the mana didn't dissipate or linger, so it had to be going somewhere. Hum. He just decided to add even more of his swirling sickly green mana, concentrating it. This seemed like it did the trick as the pieces began to float, and the eyes on the shield glowed with resurrected life once more. The three pieces floated around each other, and soon some thin ethereal arteries began connecting each piece together, pulling them closer. Jay continued to add mana until the process was over and he could feel the shield still absorbing everything around it. The three pieces pulled each other closer and glowed as mana was funneled into them. Soon the tear between them was healed, and the shield was whole again. The veins and arteries on the shield were once more brimming with the necrotic glowing mana again, as the eyes on the shield gazed at Jay, its master. Welcome back, Jay thought as he grabbed it while it was still floating in mid-air. Deathwalker's sentry repaired. Immediately he equipped it, and it squeezed his arm once. I guess it missed me too. He almost chuckled, Anya was watching. So he kept these thoughts and chuckles to himself. Sweeper finally got back with another soul stone, and Jay willed it to stop its collection duty. In total, it had collected six more for Jay. There were still some more stones out there, but they didn't really matter too much to Jay. After all, he could simply reset the dungeon, go to sleep, and wake up the next day to a large batch of them. All right. I'm ready and the skeletons are looking healthy. Let's move he said, standing up from the stone slab he was sitting on. Chapter 111. Dune Dune Dune. It was like a deep slow war drum, building up an anxious pressure for battle within the hearts of anyone who would hear it. Dune Dune. The first group of heavy soldiers approached as they marched in unison, causing small pebbles to shift on the highway. While each group of soldiers was separate, they all marched in perfect harmony. Get ready, Jay said, grasping his sword tightly as he stared ahead. Anya nodded and squinted, ready for battle. She held her crossbow up, aiming to fire as soon as the soldiers came within aggro range of the skeleton vanguard. The soldier statues suddenly got into range and began to charge. This was not their usual tactic, as they would usually either fight defensively or slowly push forward. Something's different, Jay said to Anya as he charged into the battle. Each skeleton kept a statue busy, leaving the fifth one left over for Jay to fight. Swoosh. Thwonk. 9.7. Jay dodged a sword slash and retaliated with a hammer smash. His hammer did more damage now that his strength was higher, but he didn't have any time to think about it, as they had to kill these statues as quickly as they could. Anya wasn't idle either, unleashing a stream of heavy bolts at the statue Jay was fighting. Shring shring. Each bolt shuddered and cracked off bits of the statue as its health plummeted. Nice damage thought Jay as he finished his enemy off with a final wallop of his hammer. It seemed like Anya still did more damage despite him raising his strength to 20. The swordsman statues were level 3 and only had 35 horsepower, while the spearman statues were level 4 with 50 horsepower. Without pause, Jay dashed over to a nearby statue, smashing its head with the back of his hammer while it was distracted. Anya dealt massive damage too. Soon enough the second statue fell, returning to the rubble from which it was hewn. The fight was then a 5 versus 3, and the last statues were quickly culled. Dune Dune Dune. The next set of marching statues was coming, and they barely had any breathing room. Keep fighting. Jay yelled as the skeletons returned to formation. The first fight set the pace, and since they could kill five statues before the next group would arrive, it meant they could beat this challenge. Swoosh, thwonk, ching, clink. Hammers chipped off cracking stone, while bolts sheared off large chunks as each statue was destroyed. The second group of five was culled even more quickly than the first, but the third group of statues arrived earlier than expected. Dune, dune, dune. Like clockwork, the third group of enemies charged at them. 
Did they come a little too quickly? Jay thought as he dashed at the first statue. What if they come a little more quickly each time? He wondered as he smashed a hammer against the statue. I will need to end this quickly and see. He thought as he yelled back to Anya. Finish the other swordsmen so we can free up a skeleton. I can finish this one by myself. Shring. A bolt immediately hit the other swordsman's statue. And caused it to stagger, giving the skeleton a perfect opportunity to strike. Doon doon doon. More statues were coming. Swoosh. Thwonk. Ching. Clink. Damn it, I hate being right. Jay shook his head, hearing the next group of statues coming. He quickly finished the swordsman's statue off at the same time that Anya finished the other one. The group quickly turned on the three remaining spearmen statues, and finished them off as fast as they could, but the fresh group of statues was already on them. Two spearmen went down, as the latest group of soldier statues began to charge. Jay had to dodge a spear thrust from behind right as he finished off the last statue. Jay and his skeletons had circled it, and wailed on it like a group of kids would wail on a pinata. Swoosh. Damn it, shit he almost didn't dodge the spear thrust. This was the fourth group, so there was on more after this. The challenge was coming to an end, but Jay realized that the very last fights would be harder than the first three battles combined. He had to do something to increase their damage output, so he made the call. Change up tactics, skeletons go all out. The skeleton's eyes seemed to twinkle as Jay barked out his order, like berserkers they were made for fights like this. None of them felt any pain, they simply wanted to savagely attack with a relentless assault. Immediately the skeletons jumped forward into dangerous positions. They were dealing much more damage as they span and smashed to their heart's content. But now they were taking damage in return too. The swordsman's statue that Anya was attacking. Went down to rubble first, quickly destroyed by the combined attacks of the skeleton and Anya's bolts. Next, Jay's skeleton went down to the dirt as it cracked and crumbled. Jay immediately pounced on the spearman statue near him, while Anya and the free skeleton went after another. Doon doon doon, shit. Jay clenched his jaw in heated frustration, hearing the sounds of the next group marching. The next group of five statues were already charging them while the three spearmen statues from the last group were still alive, and well comma though they were around half health. Damn it what can I do? The skeletons are already damaged we can't fight more than five we might have to retreat. Anya saw Jay's conflicted expression, even in the heat of battle she could see that he was different. It was like a piece of him was no longer in the battle, and his fighting showed it. Some of his attacks were slightly delayed, and he no longer looked around as much, his awareness seemed to drop. Immediately, Anya knew what to do as she rushed forward. What the fuck is she doing Jay thought as he smashed his hammer down on a spearman statue, while dodging the thrust from another. His concentration was dropping, and now Anya was charging into battle. Then, he realized what was about to happen. Skeletons, step back. He got them to safety so they wouldn't take more unnecessary damage. Anya kept running forward, and just before she was within attack range, she used her ability. Prostrate. The deathly majestic voice of an ancient eldritch king rang out, shivering the very souls of all who heard it. Filled with unquestionable authority, all had to obey. Duon. Each statue smashed their faces to the ground, kowtowing as if their lives depended on it. Jay was still running back while his body automatically knelt. He skidded to a halt on his knees. Each skeleton similarly bowed down, dropping their hammers before them. Rise Anya said to Jay and the skeletons, mimicking the way Jay said it with a mischievous smile. Jay and the skeletons didn't need a second order, as each of them grabbed their hammers, and began two smashed in the heads of the defenseless statues. Three spearmen statues went down quickly, and then two more swordsmen, leaving three more spearmen statues. Jay, step back it's almost over. What? They're about to get up. Jay was in the attack range of one of them, and he didn't take any chances as he immediately jumped back. Swoosh. Just in time as a spear pierced right where his head just was. A skeleton wasn't so lucky as it was struck, it went flying and skittled across the highway. Fuck he shook his head. I thought that ability lasted longer. Jay asked. They're stronger somehow. I don't know. Anya shrugged as she aimed another bolt. Shring. Damn it Jay thought. At least there's only three left he said. You can finish them off. He waved his hand as he stepped back further and began to catch his breath. The skeleton that was hit away returned to the fight with just as much vigor and ferocity as it always had. 
I guess Anya's ability doesn't count as magic, since they're magic immune. I wonder why it didn't last as long though. Jay remembered previously when fighting the leeches, even inside the leech queen's stomach he kowtowed, comma, there was plenty of time to get out of the stomach and fight back. Oh well, he thought, I don't rely on others anyway. If I wanted, I still could have activated my boots and got out of the fight safely. Finally, the last three statues went down, and the group received some notifications. Entrance challenge comma complete. 990 exp. Not a bad amount of exp I guess. Pretty decent for a short amount of time. Jay thought as he checked over the notifications comma before turning to Anya who had quite a different reaction. Anya's eyes were bulging, and she had a wide smile on her face comma the first time. Jay had seen her smile this widely. So much exp she was ecstatic, completely joyful for a moment. Gone was the icy cold indifference she usually exhibited. It would have taken a group of at least five to conquer this challenge. Diluting the experience points gain comma however, with Jay. They each received 50 perfect of the X. Suddenly, she noticed Jay looking at her. Immediately she turned away and coughed. Good job. She said before turning back again with her usual cold stare. Gah. Jay looked towards the pyramid comma the doors were moving. Each of them groaned as they opened outwards. Both doors were as thick as a road and as tall as giants. Next, six spearmen statues marched out and formed into a defensive position at the entrance. Looks like there's a welcoming party, Jay said as he gazed at them. Ready? He glanced at Anya with a slight smile. Chapter 112. Shring shring clang shring. Mathian's sword made a ringing noise as it sliced and bounced off the stone statues. Hum he frowned slightly before jumping back and staying at a safe distance. This isn't working and my fire gem has no effect on their stone bodies. Perhaps the miskeep dungeon isn't right for me, but the silt wolf one is a little too advanced. Matheson decided to leave the dungeon and do some thinking. He needed to find a dungeon that was somewhere in between. Hum, the soap rat dungeon is a little too low level now. It's not worth my time. Perhaps I will try one of those non-instance dungeons. I know there's a level 3 one somewhere in the south. Matheson decided to head back to the association to find the level 3 dungeon he vaguely remembered seeing. The non-instance dungeons were not as popular as people competed over enemies to kill. Since these dungeons were non-instanced, if people in two different parties went into one, they would see each other. No one would be alone or separate in these dungeons. Enemies would respawn quickly, and these dungeons were more like basic hunting grounds than lucrative adventures. They generally didn't have progression, and the bosses were not as threatening as an instance level 3 dungeon would be. Overall, the non-instance dungeons were much easier than their instance counterparts. Leaving Miss Keep, Matheson ran up the hill past the quarry and headed into the association. After having his clothes shredded by silt wolves, he had since bought some black clothes fitting clothes, with a dark hide tunic complete with shoulder pauldrons. The guards no longer mocked him either, as his running strides seemed more professional, and his new clothes were no longer billowing around, they matched the focused hungry flame within his eyes. Entering the association, he found a map location. Feral Plains, level 3 dungeon. Non-instanced, unlocked. It's pretty close to the stink rat marsh. Good. Matheson thought as he looked at it. There was added information about the dungeon too. A simple note which said swarm tactics. Swarm tactics. Sounds stupid. He thought as he turned and left the association. Matheson decided he would head home for a quick meal and drop his new trophies off before continuing on his mission to get stronger and become independent. So far, he was slowly acquiring these things, comma, but was also finding that he was gaining so much more, his thoughts changing as he learnt discipline and drive. Realizations about what power and strength truly meant were beginning to shape his mind, slowly turning him into a different person. As he ran down the hill like he usually did, his eyes drifted on someone lurking in the bushes below the path. He slowed down his jog for a moment out of curiosity. But soon he regained his focus, picking up his speed with a renewed spirit. What are those? Anya asked as she watched the skeletons gather some strange looking crystals. Huh. Oh, they're for a quest. Soul stones. You got a quest. She was surprised, never having heard of someone getting a quest for this dungeon. Yep, hum. I wonder if you can loot the soul stones off their corpses, now that we're in the same party. I'll try, she said as she walked over to one of the recently deceased stone soldiers. 
Nope, nothing. It must not let me since I don't have the quest. Yeah, probably Jay said, but he had his own theories about why only he could loot the soul stones. Anya proceeded to move to other corpses and loot them, making Jay confused. What are you doing? I thought you couldn't get soul stones. I'm getting the rings. Duh. The rings. Suddenly, Jay felt like his heart stopped beating as he realized a crucial mistake he had made. All this time, he only had his skeletons collecting the soul stones and ignoring the rings. Not all the statues had them, but he would have lost hundreds of rings probably. Anya was still gathering the Helvetian rings, so she didn't see Jay turning pale. Fuck he stood still. Not blinking as his eyebrows creased, I completely forgot I could have had the skeletons gather the rings this whole time. He thought to himself, and I reset the dungeon too, so those are all gone. He clenched his teeth as the realization dawned on him. He could no longer hold in his anger. Fuck. Fug. He yelled out loud as a wave of frustration rolled over him. Whoa, what? Anya turned and looked at him, worried they might be under attack. Jay was red, an angry expression on his face as he looked at the rubble on the ground, clenching his fists. Nothing he snapped and exhaled angrily, never mind. He said softly and turned away. Okay, Anya said, a little confused before she went back to gathering. Meanwhile, Jay was commanding his skeletons mentally. Always gather all loot from creatures. Always. He enforced a new rule on his skeletons, yelling through his thoughts to them as he gritted his teeth. Jay got so caught up with the soul stone quest he received, that it was like he got tunnel vision. The skeletons happily obliged, following their master's new order, which was more like a rule now, as they started to get Helvetian rings from the corpses too. I don't even want to calculate how much gold I've lost. He shook his head, still frustrated. Anya was still collecting the loot with hungry eyes and a tiny smile, not missing a single statue as she ignored Jay's weirdness and went about her business. Anya, half of those are mine, of course. She said, glad that Jay didn't demand more, since he technically did most of the work. After looting all 25 corpses, they both took a break. Anya retrieved what crossbow bolts she could while Jay healed his skeletons. Thankfully the skeletons didn't suffer too much damage, so after restoring them, Jay's mana was still relatively high, his mind still sharp. Now that they were ready, they began to march closer to the pyramid entrance. The open doors of the pyramid still had six spearmen statues guarding the front ever vigilant. Six statues shouldn't be too hard, Jay said as he squinted at them, looking for traps. Hopefully, Anya said, trying not to sound too doubtful. I'll distract two of them, leaving a skeleton to fight each of the statues. You can attack one of the statues the skeletons are fighting, so they can help the others before helping me. Sure. Anya nodded, readying her crossbow. Chapter 113. Go. Jay said, sending his skeletons in to fight. He quickly then ran to the side and started smashing his hammer against two statues, successfully grabbing their attention and causing them to focus on him. The plan was working perfectly so far. With the two statues now slashing at him, he focused completely on dodging. Sue. Anya began blasting one of the other statues with her crossbow, as chips and chunks of stone began to fly off and break away. Jay was still focused on dodging as the two spearmen thrusting at him ceaselessly, the endless barrage of attacks keeping him busy. Thankfully it didn't take too long before the first statue was slain. 50x, 6 versus 5. Each of them got half of the X from the first crumbling level 4 spearmen. Nice, Jay thought, dodging under another spear swing then sidestepping a thrust. Clun. Minus, 4.2. His shield took a hit as the spearman used its double strike ability. Jay sidestepped another follow-up thrust, raising his shield up again, just in case it was a double strike. Anya and the skeletons were just as busy, as the skeletons' hammers and her bolts continued to ring out, as they pummeled against the statues. 50x. Another statue went down as its knees buckled, becoming ruins with the rest of Holvetia. Now that it was 6 versus 4, the speed of statue deaths increased exponentially, the battle would end soon. Jay had the next free skeleton come over and attack one of the two statues he was fighting, giving himself some breathing room. The skeleton gained the attention of one of them, so now Jay could start fighting back too. Thwunk, smash, dring. Finally, now he could attack. After all the thrusts and swipes he dodged he was raring for battle. He walloped the statue without mercy as he quickly shattered its helmet. 
14.4, His hammers were doing much more damage now that he put more points into strength and leveled up. 50x, 50x. The group ended two statues at once, and Jay decided to step back from the fight. The skeletons could handle the last two statues. So Jay stretched as he stood next to Anya. It's no wonder you're leveling up so fast. It's like you're in a party of five, but you get all the exp. Anya commented as they watched the last two statues being ravaged by hammers. Yeah. Jay smiled slyly, knowing they even fought for him while he was sleeping. Let's head inside he added. The cavernous mouth of the pyramid was open wide to them. After standing silently for countless centuries it was finally unlocked, waiting for its first victims. Of course in other instances of this dungeon people had conquered this pyramid. But this was a new instance. As far as this dungeon was concerned, Jay and Anya were the first ones here. As Jay and Anya approached the darkness, a stale, thick wave of foul air assaulted them. You, disgusting. Anya said as her face crinkled. Smells like death. Jay similarly was frowning from the putrid smell. They pulled out luminous orbs as they walked into the darkness of the pyramid. On each side, giant pairs of statues of different soldier types were on each side, like massive columns. Jay analyzed each of them before proceeding, but they had no level comma thankfully these were just scenery, otherwise each of them could crush Jay and Anya, simply by stepping down from each of the pedestals they stood on. The first in the series of statues were quite different, they had no weapons, or even legs comma they seemed to float somehow, though they had clawed metal gauntlets. There was no mana signature or anything, they were like rocks frozen in the air. After those were two-handed swordsmen, archer, spearman and lastly sword statues. It seemed backwards to Jay because he would expect the swordsmen to be at the front, followed by the spearmen. This was the general structure of the dungeon thus far too. On each side of the walls that the statues were placed in front of were more murals. The murals showed mountains of crystals, lines of soldiers leading to a circular altar, and lines of soldier statues. Near the altar was a large pit. Perhaps this is what the pyramid was built on, Anya guessed. Anya had already ventured closer to the murals behind the statues, looking across them as she tried to find any clues about this pyramid, while she was trying to decipher what they were depicting. Seems like some sort of ritual, she whispered, though her voice still traveled through the silent structure echoing off the flat walls. Anya J whispered, you can look at those later. Sure, sorry. She hopped back near Jay. Jay had already given his luminous orb to one of his minions, and was squeezing his nose with his hand. The stench was many times worse than all the other things he had smelt thus far. They walked silently past the statues with the skeletons ahead of them. Unfortunately, the skeletons made light tapping noises as they crept ahead, decreasing their chances of staying undiscovered. The hall split off into three passageways, each path descending downwards into the earth. Let's clear left first, Jay whispered. Anya nodded back silently under the warm light from the luminous orb. They were already a few hundred meters down the passageway, and they began passing through some sections of blue glowing crystal. The crystals were seamlessly built into the walls, the floor and the roof forming a rectangular ring. Each time they passed through, the crystal rings glowed green as they responded to their presence. However, the skeletons made them glow yellow. Jay and Anya only had confused expressions as they went through cautiously. They turned back to blue after passing through. It seemed like they were a scanner of some sort. Yura. A distant whimper, a lonely moan echoed and reverberated through the darkness. Jay, Anya and all the skeletons paused as they listened to the sound. It was coming from further down the passage below. The sound made Jay cautious while he held his shield up to see down the passage. But nothing, there was no response. He looked towards Anya, comma, tiny hairs were visibly raised on her arms. For some reason the single sound scared her much more than Jay. Without saying a word, Jay decided to have a skeleton walk behind them as well, protecting them from either side. They eventually came to an iron door. It had no door handle, instead it had a large iron bar with inscriptions covering it, and a message. Click, 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 click. Before they approached the door to read the message, a series of sounds came from behind it. Sounds of many lightly tapping footsteps came from the other side. They must have been made from stone too, but much lighter as their feet made gentle tapping sounds against the floor comma rather, than heavy plodding thumps like the soldier statues did. The inscriptions were undecipherable as it was written in with some sort of advanced Helvetian hex magic, 
but the message accompanying it was still partly readable. For crimes, comma, unreadable, forever sealed. Alma, unreadable, certain death. A faint green light came from under the door, but both Jay and Anya couldn't make anything else out. Jay tapped Anya on the shoulder, beckoning her to come back further up the passageway, so they could talk without whatever was in the room hearing. What do you think? Jay whispered. I think it's dangerous. Certain death. M.N. But, I want to know. Jay shrugged. And this is a level 3 dungeon. How bad could it be? I'm level T9. 10 almost. He quickly corrected himself. I'm curious 2 plus. I've just about recovered from my last use of prostrate. About 10 more minutes and I should be ready. Good. Let's just do it. If anything happens, just leave the dungeon while I have the skeletons hold them off. I'll get the skeletons to open the door too. In case it's some kind of trap. Just tell me when you're ready. Sure. Anya nodded. She was as curious as Jay about what was behind the door. Jay decided to go back to the door. He got on his knees and peeked under. In the room there was what looked like a large cylinder of glass. Filled with some sort of purple translucent fluid. It seemed like it went further down into the room. Making Jay think there were probably stairs on the other side of the door. Suddenly five sharp dark brown daggers tapped across the door entrance skittering across swiftly. Jay recoiled his head back quickly, startled as he tried to not make a sound. What the fuck was that he thought, holding his breath? Dot author here. I'm anticipating people asking why Jay is doing 14.4 damage with a 6 damage bone hammer. New weapon damage calculation for anyone interested. Author here calculates and describes levels and damage. If you are interested, search the novel. Note at the end of chapter 113. In short, it depends on level and strength. For everyone else, let's get the story going. Chapter 114. After one skeleton approached the door, the metal bar wouldn't budge. Jay placed his hand on it to move it to help, but it started heating up. Jay had to remove his hand before it started burning. Hmm, I guess no humans can enter. Thankfully, the inscribed metal bar didn't react to Jay's skeletons, so he stood back and had his other three come to help lift it. The bar was enormous, enough to keep a giant out, even the four skeletons could barely lift it. Clong. The bar thudded as it hit the ground, and the heavy metal door could be opened. Two skeletons were now required to pull it open, and it groaned lightly due to its immense weight. The thickness of door itself was as wide as Jay's sword. Their element of surprise was now gone. Jay pursed his lips as he cautiously walked past the door. On the other side of the door were numerous lacerations and deep cuts over the metal. Jay had his skeletons wait a moment at the entrance forming a wall. He knew there was something out there in the darkness as he saw something moving below the door. Unfortunately, after waiting for a few minutes common nothing, with a quiet sigh, he began to move in. Entering the next room, he found himself on the upper level with some stairs leading down to the right. Careful, there's no railing. He whispered to Anya who was slightly behind him. Looking around he found the source of the purple light. Twelve large glass cylinders were filled with a glowing purple liquid. Each cylinder was huge. Like massive industrial storage tanks, each of them were two stories high. The purple fluid didn't glow too brightly, only illuminating the floor around their bases. The rest of the room was still pitch black. The small party of six cautiously creeped down the stairs, slowly, so that they could watch out for any threat, and retreat in a moment's notice, comma, but still, nothing attacked. Jay put his skeletons into a box formation as they got to the ground level, his shield raised to peer out into the darkness. Their shade vision didn't care about the lack of light. Jay first approached one of the cylinders. At the bottom was what seemed like a small mound but he had to take a second look. Stepping closer, he peered inside. Inside was some unnatural, sickly pure white flesh at the bottom of the tank, a few soul stones meshed in with it. It was hard to tell what it was originally, but it seemed that the outside was preserved by the fluid even though the inside had long since rotted. Different bones and soul stones poked out of the decayed flesh as it turned to a gelatinous blob over time. Perhaps the soul stones were implanted into it while it was alive. He guessed moving to the next tank to find something similar. What the hell is this place? Anya quickly whispered, sounding scared. Some sort of experimental chamber by the looks of it. Jay said, trying not to sound rude as it was obvious. On nearby walls were a series of empty sockets. 
though some had empty soul stones in them. Jay quickly stashed the soul stones from the wall sockets, adding them to his inventory, while Anya remained cautious as she looked around, hoping to see something in the quiet darkness around them. She was still tense from whatever sound they heard. As they walked deeper into the chamber, they found some large perfectly flat stone tables around the room, some between the glass tanks and others pushed up against the walls. Some tables were covered with strangely shaped glassware, while others had carved inscriptions and engravings. Tools of various kinds were on the tables too, and to Jay, some of them looked like they might be spell channels. Jay analyzed some of them, but it seemed that they were cursed with Holvisha's revenge, comma, they either crumbled to rubble or turned to ashes at his touch. He was a little defeated as he wanted another spell channel. Surely the ones used for these hidden experiments would be of the highest quality. Some small luminous orbs were on the tables which Jay quickly grabbed. Unfortunately, after adding mana, he found that they were not as bright as his own budget-friendly orb, so he simply stored them in his inventory. Faded Orb X3. The stench was getting worse as they walked, but they could almost see the far the end of the room, as there were two more large glowing glass vats, comma, however. These were much larger than the previous 12, each being about the size of Jay's house. Jay squinted, seeing something different about them, comma, a large and spiral-shaped life form was inside each of them, tempting Jay to come and look. Unlike the smaller glass tubes, whatever was inside had at least remained intact, though this didn't mean it was alive. Jay stopped himself from rushing, as he still kept his guard up, while he moved closer to these massive glass tanks. After getting closer, he found that there were actually three of these tanks, comma, the third, one wasn't glowing at all however, since the luminous fluid had drained out through a large shattered hole. It must have shattered a long time ago, as the fluid had all dried up and disappeared. As they walked closer to the three huge tanks, the smell was getting worse. They walked by a broken down sliding wall, one of the ones that the statues would hide behind to ambush, clearly. Something was not patient enough for it to open. Inside were the remains of two jewel dagger statues, and behind them another passage. Jay instantly realized this was where the smell was coming from as a wave of stench assaulted his nose as he passed by. Both Jay and Anya's faces were scrunched up in disgust. Unfortunately, neither of them could hold their nose as they had their weapons drawn. I.E. itch. Suddenly a loud deathly screeching sound rang out from behind them. Jay turned around to see a massive dark brown creature with leathery skin climbing up the side of the stairs that they just walked down easily walking up the side of the wall. Chapter 115 As soon as Jay laid his eyes on its unholy, twisted form, he got a notification. Chimera Research 15% Hidden quest acquired. Jay ignored the notification, temporarily stunned at the sight of the creature as his mind raced with thoughts. It's so huge, how did it get behind us without us noticing? How is it so quiet? Why didn't it attack? Jay had no answers as his eyes drifted over its hideous body. Much of its torso and back was made of many human spines, twisted, welded and molded together in some wicked ritual to form its thick, long body. Like some unholy mixture of flesh and magic, soul stones were scattered across its body, randomly poking through its leathery brown flesh. Each of the soul stones glowed slightly, seemingly still occupied by souls. Its long body was still going off into the darkness, so it was hard to tell how large it actually was. Multiple spiny sword-like legs with knees poked out from each side of its segmented body. The creature's human head was looking at Jay. Gazing at him with its toothless mouth slinged open, it seemed that only the eyes were still functional. Shivers went up Jay's spine as the creature gazed at him. It felt like it was looking at his soul, and could find him wherever he went. Before Jay could even respond, his skeletons moved to the front protecting their master. The room went silent for a moment as the creature was still staring at Jay. Was it sizing him up, preparing to fight? Jay snapped out of it and started analyzing. The Hexapid Soul Eater, comma, level 133. Jay froze after seeing its level. He had to reread it a few times. Its level was unimaginable to Jay. They were less than ants before it, completely at its mercy. The creature could kill both of them with a single attack. It was clear now that it definitely was not sizing them up. It could wipe them all out with a flick of one of its many legs. I -E itch. Suddenly it screeched again before turning to the open gate. Without warning it scurried through the open doorway. It was fast, but its body was long, 
pausing it to look like a blur as it all skittered through comma though. Not before Jay analyzed it, reading the rest of its stats. Dehexapid Soul Eater, comma, level 133. HP 755 slash 755. Skills. Congenital linking, comma, 3 slash 3. Shares its strength with other creatures. Amalgamation, comma, soul stones. Consumes, comma, soul stones to grow stronger. Has become immortal due to the nature of its prey. Dire Blades. The Dehexapid slashes its target with its saber talons. 141 damage per successful leg slash. Brittle armor. 40% damage reduction to slashing. Stabbing damage. 20% more damage taken from crushing damage. Holvisha's Revenge. Magic damage immune. Any wielded weapons become cursed. Description. A soldier of the Holvetian kingdom turned to stone. It stands guard, waiting for its chance to exact revenge on those who would harm its kingdom. Noises of its tapping sword-like feet got quieter as Jay and Anya stood there silently. It was moving at a high speed up the passageway. A few red lights came from the passageway, comma, the creature. Caused the crystal rings to turn red as it went through. Suddenly a deep grinding sound came from the passageway. It seemed that the creature had triggered something. They both breathed a quiet sigh of relief, as it clearly wasn't interested in them. What Anya asked, I'm blinking with her eyes wide open. It could have killed us in one hit. Jay shook his head, he had no answers. Anya bit her lip as she shook her head, she almost couldn't believe what she just saw. Much more scared than Jay who still appeared almost normal. Jay continued my analysis said it's a Holvetian soldier. But it definitely wasn't that much as clear. It didn't attack us either, which I think is more strange. Just what the hell was that thing? Jay wondered to himself, still a little shocked, comma, though a part of him was also curious. He wanted to see it again. He could have just met his death, but all he was thinking about was the interesting monster. The creature's skills made it seem like a mix of a failed experiment and a Helvetian soldier. Similar to his skeletons, it too had retained some skills from whatever comma or whoever comma it was made out of. A shiver went over Jay as he realized he could have just been killed. Fuck he shook his head pulling out some water to drink. Anya and Jay stood silently for a moment, they needed it. Doon, doon, doon. A series of deep sounds rolled through the pyramid along with a shudder. It seemed to come from above. It sounded like mountain-sized boulders were being tossed and toppled. The glassware on the tables began to lightly shift and clinker from the vibrations. Jay and Anya had to act, no time for any respite. Should we move back up or stay here? It actually seems safer here now. I think that metal door was what was keeping this thing inside here, Anya said. Jay was looking up at the ceiling, I don't think it's gonna collapse. John, let's just finish searching this chamber. If it gets worse, we can just leave and reset the dungeon. Jay suggested, speaking normally again, now that the whole pyramid would have woken up. Dune. Jay had two of his skeletons walk with Anya, while he had two guards for himself. There was probably nothing else here, but it was better to be safe. They began their search. Maybe there would be loot here since it was sealed off. Anya walked towards the broken wall passageway where the foul smell was coming from, while Jay headed straight for the three large tanks. Jay was like a kid opening presents, his eyes almost sparkling as he got closer, seeing the specimens inside. His eyes were wide with wonder as he approached the specimens in the tanks, they seemed like works of art to Jay. Even though these grotesque things had been dead for centuries, he gleaned some knowledge from them as he studied their parts and bodies. Chimera Research 16%. Chimera researched 17%. So cool he thought, looking at the mixture of flesh and inanimate materials melded together. He felt like all it made sense somehow. Jay would have really liked to meet whoever put these strange things together, comma, though. He was conflicted as there was human parts mixed into the creature. It just felt wrong. He wondered if his skeletons counted as inanimate. Bones were once living like flesh, filled with osteoblasts and stem cells, comma, but now were inanimate, dead. Structures of calcium deposits. With Jay's magic, it was like they were now something in between. Jay looked over his soldiers and went back to the description. An abomination, its existence spits in the face of life, and death, comma, and they spit back. Flee if possible. Execute with extreme prejudice, burn the bones burn the bones. Hum Jay wondered why the description would say such a thing. Maybe there was some living material inside. Perhaps it was simply to expel the necrotic mana. 
After seeing the dehexapod soul eater along with the degrading life forms in the tanks, he finally agreed comma his skeletons were abominations. However, they were his abominations, his own little horrors. Jay found a bench near them with a journal. He went to touch it, but stopped just before comma he knew it would turn to ash. He analyzed it to at least know the title of the journal. Estoba's journal. Jay raised a brow. Estoba, huh? I'll have to ask Sedulus to get any real answers. Dune. Another sound interrupted his train of thoughts. More deep sounds came from above, but were getting less regular. Whatever was happening above them was coming to an end. Chapter 116. Jay wondered what the dehexapod was doing up there, and then he remembered the other notification he got after gazing at it. Hidden quest acquired. He opened it, hoping that it wouldn't ask him to slay a level 133 monster. Hidden quest comma slay the assistant. Slay the assistant. Progress. 0 slash 2 slayed. Assistant, singular. But it says I need to slay two of them. Probably some more mysterious bullshit, typical. He thought nothing about Holvetia or its pyramids was straightforward and simple. Jay looked through more notes and other loot, but found nothing except more glassware, tools and inscriptions. All of them were useless as they crumbled at his touch. This was fine though, as to Jay. Getting the Chimera experience was enough to satisfy him. Besides, the pyramid was still undefeated. Maybe there was still loot waiting for him. Anyway, it wasn't like there would be some ultra-powerful, mystical magic item that suited Jay perfectly waiting in every room. With the room searched and the specimen tanks all oogled enough, it was time to find Anya. Jay could sense the two skeletons he had to escort her, so he knew she was coming back through the passageway. Jay waited at the corner of the passage and put his orb in his inventory, silent as he waited in the darkness. Anya's light was coming closer, along with the skeletons which he was sensing, and finally she exited the passage. Hi, Jay smiled. Anya jumped back and held her hands up, completely startled. Don't do that, she pouted. Hey, sorry. Find anything interesting. He took out his orb again. Ah, I found the pit, the one from the murals. I think it's filled with skeletons, she said hesitantly. Her face was a little pale, comma, perhaps it was from the smell the skeletons in the pit, or from Jay scaring her. Maybe a mixture of all three. Of course, Jay only heard pitful of skeletons. He didn't need to know anything else as he turned to go into the passageway. Awesome, I'm going in. Okay, and did you find anything interesting? Nope, just a bunch of junk that crumbles when you touch it. Or okay, Anya said, she headed towards the large tanks to see the life forms inside. Jay walked with a spring in his step towards the pit. It seemed that he was going to be okay on skeletons for a while. His mind was more focused on the skeletons now, so it seemed like the smell was getting less powerful. Neither Jay or Anya could compare the smell to anything, but the closest description of the smell was like a mix of ammonia and rotting eggs, with some rotting fruit undertones. It seems that centuries had passed, and whatever was used to preserve the bodies had long since decomposed and evaporated. The rotting process began, and the smell had only concentrated over time, as it was locked away in this dark underground chamber. Jay had no hesitation as he walked through the passage towards the pit, undeterred by the smell. Finally he arrived in the room, walking out onto a semi-circle platform that overlooked everything. Whoa he said, shocked at how large this chamber was. The pit was gigantic, and Jay had to pause for a moment as he gazed at a sea of pale white bones below him. Unfortunately, his light was not doing justice to what he saw, and most of the skeletons in the pit were still hidden in the darkness. The pit must have been huge, because he couldn't see any other walls in this room. Jay was curious, and he had an idea, finding a use for one of the faded orbs. He took the small orb from his inventory, and added as much mana as he could into it. The orb only responded by slightly glowing like a large firefly. But this was enough for Jay's purposes. Okay, here it goes. He grasped the orb and stood back. Jay had each of his skeletons stand to the side as he backed up. Then he ran forward towards the pit and threw it as far as he could with all the strength he could muster. The glowing orb went extremely far across the room, making a whistling noise as it coursed through the wind. Jay's adventurous strength gave his body a large boost, which even surprised himself. What was more surprising though, was that the orb was still going. Soon its trajectory flattened out and began to fall. 
It eventually went down behind something in the darkness, and Jay waited patiently as he waited for the noise of it hitting the ground. Crack. A loud sound and a flash of light rang out, echoing off the walls. Jay didn't realize that when an orb shatters it releases a large amount of light, similar to a lightning strike. The flash of light briefly lit up a large part of the room, as well as causing a silhouette of what it went behind. It was a mountain of corpses, skeletons, filling up this deep ravine. This was more than simply a mass grave, comma, this was the entire burial site of Holvisha. Countless skeletons were piled up. The ones at the bottom of the pile were probably ground to dust from the pressure of the ones on top. Even in Jay's peripherals, he didn't see the walls on either side during the intense flash of light. Somehow the room was even wider than it was long. Oh, he was speechless. The room really was enormous. And he was still coming to terms with all the skeletons in here. Jay realized he had to get down there somehow. To a necromancer, this was like a wonderland, a dream. One man's corpse was another man's treasure after all. He did feel a strange sense of remorse for wanting to take these skeletons. But he knew that these had merely become empty vessels, comma, the souls of the Helvetians were all transferred into soul stones by now. Even the Helvetians had not given these real graves, as no one had died. This is why they were discarded here like trash. So Jay quickly stifled any remorse he had. Hum, pum, quote, Jay walked around one side of the platform, finding nothing. The other side, however, had a path, comma, and it was going downwards. Jay had a large grin as soon as he discovered it. And Sedulus said there was no treasure here, he shook his head with a smile. Jay walked down the path, of course, with a skeleton in front, comma, who knows what could still be alive down here after all these centuries. Or what could have grown and evolved. After walking for some time, he finally came to the shoreline of the Sea of Bones. Finally, he smiled, approaching a skeleton and raising a hand. The ring responded to his thoughts, shifting into its second form, as his beloved bones floated around him, comma, it then began to slowly pick up bones from the skeletal sea. It was like they were magnetized by him. Oh yes, fuck yeah, Jay was ecstatic, a wide smile on his face. He hit the motherload. At first, he had some doubts, comma, thinking that maybe the skeletons would be part of the dungeon environment, or perhaps they would simply be too old to even be recognized as bones anymore, comma, but that was not the case, making this prize all the more sweeter. The bones waved, floated and clinked around him gently, while more and more bones were added to the swirling mass. Shit, he said excitedly, just how many can I have in this ring? The swirling mass of bones was starting to get huge, turning into a cyclone, comma, and Jay had only taken a few steps forward. There was still a whole room left that he couldn't even see the walls of. Just how many can go into my ring? The breeze was starting to blow now. The light wind created because of the twirling mass all around and above Jay. He took a few more steps forward, slowly carving a path in the sea of bones. Even Jay was now starting to feel a little tense as he looked up at the swirling bones all around him, blocking nearly all his vision. There were simply too many. If his powers suddenly gave up, he would probably even be crushed. Still, he took another step forward and another and another. Something in him, deep in his subconscious, was driving him forward, enticing him to take just one more step. So many bones he smiled, shaking his head. Suddenly, after taking more steps forward, he stepped on something, comma, a femur. He then got a notification. Huh. I guess the ring got full. Criteria met, comma, 100, slash 100 skeletons. Necrotic ring, comma, evolution available. What? He said, shocked that it could even do such a thing. Chapter 117. Criteria met, comma, 100, slash 100 skeletons. Necrotic ring, comma, evolution available. Jay opened the notification, full of expectation. Consume all stored skeletons to evolve the necrotic ring. Yes slash, no. Without a second thought, Jay hit yes. Unfortunately for Jay, he didn't realize that this would include all the silt wolf corpses he had gathered. He was simply too excited to have his ring evolved, and the next moment he realized, comma, it was already too late. Oh wait, damn it. Shit, the blue bones were gone as soon as he accepted. Oh well, I'll just get more he thought. The blue bones weren't that important anyway, so it was likely that he would forget about them in a moment like this. All the bones floating around Jay suddenly stopped, freezing in mid-air. Next, they changed direction and converged in front of Jay, gathering into a large massive ball. After the last bone touched the ball, there was silence for a moment. Suddenly, 
the ball contracted like it was imploding, pulling itself into the middle, as if there was a black hole there. All of the bones cracked and turned to dust under the immense force. Jay grimaced as he watched and heard them all snapping and squeezing together, hoping a piece wouldn't fly out and hit him in the face at warp speed. The orb got smaller and smaller as it tried to form into a ring shape, though it was much bigger because of all the bone mass, currently resembling a thick bracelet or a bangle. Soon it seemed like the pale white ring gave up on actually becoming a ring, and it began to morph. It seemed almost like a white liquid as it formed a sort of claw-like finger. Instead of being a ring, it now appeared more like the chopped off finger of a gothic crusader knight's gauntlet, though it still had a single red band going around it. The necrotic sensibility was what caused the ring to have a red band in the first place, so it was still the same size. Finally, after all the squeezing and snapping, molding and melding, the process was over. The single finger piece of what looked like an impressive jagged gothic gauntlet floated over gently to Jay. He held his hand out as it found its place snugly on his finger. Awesome he turned his hand and looked over it. It came complete with joints. So he could still move his finger comma it would have sucked otherwise. The first thing he did of course was analyze the ring well the finger piece. Necrotic finger. 0% full. Functions. Transplant. Bones are extracted from the surroundings and added to the ring. Bones are extracted from the ring, floating around the wielder. Amputation comma finger form. Only the desired amount of bones are extracted. Do not float. Shift comma finger form. The ring changes form, storing the bones in a different form. No mana cost. Description. Bone storage. Awesome. A new skill. Amputation. J checked over the new function. Hum, so I don't have to summon a swelling cyclone of bones to extract some bones from the ring. I guess that will make it useful when I have a lot of bones and only want to summon one skeleton. He thought as he looked up better than having a whirlpool of bones rattling and tapping around. Jay realized that this would also help to conceal his presence, stopping it from being given away. If he had to summon quietly. Maybe now I could even sneak into cities and summon an army of skeletons, comma, and before anyone realized it was me, it would be too late. He slyly smiled, but for now I only have four. Jay looked at his own perennial skeletons before looking back at the sea of skeletons around him. Well, I better get this leveled up. He flexed his new finger armor a few times. He shifted his necrotic finger again into the orbital ring form, and it turned into an empty circle of green luminous gas, with only the dust of bones floating through it, comma, it was empty now, though not for long. Without warning, bones started floating into it once more, automatically plucked from the mass grave, being added to the ring more quickly than it previously did. The bones once again formed a ring around him, slowly becoming a curtain as more were poured into its domain. Jay noticed something was a little different this time, comma, the bones floated slightly further away. The ring had gotten bigger, and now more bones could float in it, comma, but just how many? Interesting, Jay would need to keep adding bones until the ring could level up again. Thankfully, all he had to do was walk forward into the mass burial. Realizing this, he picked up the pace and began taking steps more quickly. He was no longer going to wait till every single bone was sucked off the ground or pulled from the tangled mass of skeletons. The spinning ring of bones tapped against the sea of bones, helping to loosen some of them, comma, only to become a part of the storm. Jay walked right up to the wall of bones and waited as they were drawn into his orbit. After a few minutes, another notification finally appeared, and another massive cyclone of skeletons were floating in the air around him. It's almost too easy, he smiled, opening the notification. Criteria met, 200 slash 200 skeletons. Necrotic finger, comma, evolution available. Consume all stored skeletons to evolve the necrotic ring. Yes, slash, no. Yes, obviously yes. He nodded with a grin, comma, there was still a mountain of skeletons to collect after this. Again, the same process happened, comma, though a little different, of course. The bones all condensed into a small orb and began to try forming the finger, but to no avail. After giving up, it gently took the shape of two of these gothic gauntlet fingers. Two fingers now. He raised a brow, comma, though was still smiling. It seemed that it was slowly forming a gauntlet. I wonder, if I get enough skeletons, would I find myself in a full suit of armor? He thought as he looked at the sea of skeletons around him. Only one way to find out, I guess. He chuckled as the two finger pieces floated towards him, nestling themselves on his fingers. 
Chapter 118 He analyzed the new armor before he began gathering more bones. Necrotic fingers. 0% full. Functions. Transplant. Bones are automatically extracted from the surroundings and added to the ring. Bones are extracted from the ring, float around the wielder. Amputation comma fingers form. Only the desired amount of bones are extracted. Do not float. Bones can be extracted from the surroundings and added to the ring. Shift comma two fingers. The ring changes form, storing the bones in a different form. No mana cost. Description. Bone storage. Oh, not much is different. Oh hang on, amputation changed. So I can now extract bones without having to shift the ring. Another useful change was added, and Jay immediately tried it of course. Approaching the wall of bones, he held out his hand like he was going to use some sort of powerful force on it. He held his hand at the wrist and braced himself. Any onlooker would have thought he was about to release a powerful spell capable of wiping out a city. Amputation, he thought, desiring a bone to enter his dual finger armor. The bone he targeted rattled for a moment, and then began to float gently towards him. Not as dramatic as Jay wanted. As the bone came within reaching distance, Jay lost control of his hand as it grasped the bone. Huh, he thought, wondering what was happening. Suddenly the two finger pieces of armor squeezed with unnatural strength, crushing the bone as if it were nothing more than a dried out leaf. While the bone turned into two separate pieces with only dust and fragments left in the middle. The two pieces had splits and cracks in them, and now the necrotic gas had caught them from falling to the ground, like flies in honey, their fate was sealed. The gas entered the cracks, and they were then split into smaller pieces before being stuck onto the finger armor. Somehow, the bone fragments began to dissolve and disappear. They melted like ice sitting on a bench, turning to liquid before disappearing completely. Jay couldn't stop smiling seeing this weird trick. He did it again a few more times with different size bones. To him, it was simply too amazing. There was also a feeling of contentment welling up in him each time he snapped a bone like it was a twig. After satisfying himself enough, he finally stopped, realizing that Anya would be getting bored too. Okay, time to get back to business. Jay shifted his ring to the orbital form again, and began carving another path through the skeleton sea. Some time later, he got the notification again. Criteria met comma 400 slash 400 skeletons. Necrotic fingers comma evolution available. Consume all stored skeletons to evolve the necrotic ring. Yes slash no. Oh, it's not going up by 100, it's doubling down. He pursed his lips. The first evolution needed 100 skeletons. The next was 200 and now 400. Jay hoped that it would stick to only needing an extra 100, but it seemed that fate had already given him enough today. At least he thought so anyway. Well, even having 100 skeletons is crazy. He shrugged, allowing the evolution. After the process completed once more, there were now three fingers, comma, but no new skills or changes to the item. Jay continued anyway, gathering even more bones. The swirling mass of bones around him was truly getting large now, as he needed 800 skeletons to satisfy the next evolution. It was simple enough, comma, he just kept walking down the ramp deeper into the sea of skeletons. Before long, he had his next notification. Criteria met, comma, 800 slash 800 skeletons. Necrotic fingers, comma, evolution available. Consume all stored skeletons to evolve the necrotic ring. Yes slash no. Yes, he thought, getting the fourth finger of his hand, and then gathering more bones. Criteria met comma 1600 slash 1600 skeletons. Necrotic fingers comma evolution available. Consume all stored skeletons to evolve the necrotic ring. Yes slash no. Yet, yeah, some thumb armor appeared, all four fingers and his thumb were now covered. The skeletons swirling above were also like a threatening storm as the ring could hold more and more bones in the air. Jay hardly had to move as it seemed that the storm of bones pulling the skeletons into itself was getting stronger. By now, he made it to the bottom of the ramp and was on the ground level, the bottom of the pit. Still, he kept moving as he had skeletons to gather. The necrotic gauntlet was still incomplete as the pieces of finger armor only slightly connected at the sides. His palm and the top of his hand were still bare. He went to gather more skeletons, comma, but he heard a faint yell through the storm of bones. Anya was calling. Jay. Anya yelled out through the masses of swelling bones. Jay shifted the ring back into the five finger armor. The swelling storm of bones above and around Jay all suddenly flew into a single point. 
It was like they were all a swarm of birds which suddenly dived on a single target. The bones gathered, condensed and became the five-finger armor, and found its rightful place on Jay's hand. With all of their rattles and tapping disappearing the room suddenly went quiet again. It was like a hurricane had vanished before their eyes. How long had he been here anyway? He completely lost track. Anya. Hello. He saw her waving her luminous orb. She was standing much further up the path with Jay's skeletons, looking a little concerned as all the flying bones disappeared. Ah, I was just wondering, how long do you think this is gonna take? She asked, trying not to sound rude. I don't know. There's a lot of bones here. But it seems like I'm getting faster at collecting them, so maybe not too long. Did you want to leave? You can leave the dungeon and come back later maybe. Jay suggested, feeling a little bad about making her wait. Oh, no, it's okay, I'll wait. You continue. Anya said quickly. She didn't want to miss the opportunity to keep running through the dungeon with Jay. After all, Jay was hard to get a hold of. Even Villada had problems trying to get some time with Jay. Plus, even after waiting she would still have more exp than if she partied with someone who didn't have skeletons. Anya sat down cross-legged, putting her elbow on her knee, and leaning her chin on her hand. Jay smiled seeing her sitting in the darkness of the dungeon patiently, and he felt bad for making her wait. He walked over and pulled out his trusty chair. Here you go, have a rest. He patted the chair. Thanks. She smiled softly. Jay then went back to the massive wall of bones and shifted his ring, continuing his gathering process. Chapter 119. Criteria met comma 3200 slash 3200 skeletons. Criteria met comma 6400 slash 6400 skeletons. Criteria met comma 12800 slash 12800 skeletons. Dot dot dot. Criteria met comma 500,000 slash 500,000 skeletons. The number of skeletons being consumed was astronomical. An hour had passed, and finally Jay's gauntlet was complete. There was even some armor which was starting to travel up towards his elbow, though it simply looked like an extension of the gauntlet. The gathering process had become exponential too, as the ring of bones which floated around him got much larger. From afar, it looked like a deathly hurricane, a storm which could threaten to blow away anything that would dare to stand before it, comma, however. They were just gently floating bones. No damage would be done if someone stood in it. Above him now floated the remaining skeletons from within the pit. Jay recognized that it was well over half a million, as he had just used that many to evolve the gauntlet comma, but it wasn't enough to hit the next evolution. Still, having over half a million skeletons was just ridiculous. He wondered if he would ever need all of them. Since the skeletons had run out and its evolution fuel had run out, he analyzed it finally. Necrotic Gauntlet, 67% full, skills, uncaring rip, only usable in gauntlet form, rip out a random bone from the living, scales with level, higher level equals more vital bone acquired, 0.001% chance to execute, 2 hour cooldown, pitiful mortal, only usable in gauntlet form, swat away a pitiful spell as if it were a bug, skeletons within storage take the damage instead. 10 second cooldown. Functions. Transplant. Bones are automatically extracted from the surroundings and added to the ring. Bones are extracted from the ring, floating around the wielder. Amputation comma gauntlet form. Only the desired amount of bones are extracted. Do not float. Bones can be extracted from the surroundings and added to the ring. Living blueprints. Can store pre-assembled parts. Shift comma gauntlet. The ring changes form, storing the bones in a different form. No mana cost. Description. Bone storage. Well, uncaring rip. Pitiful mortal. Suddenly, as soon as he said pitiful mortal, Jay's hand automatically sprung up in front of him. Well, so it does it for me. He smiled, looking at his gauntlet. It seemed that Jay wouldn't even have to look at an incoming spell to swat it away. Not to mention the fear factor that would be induced in someone who had their spell swatted away. While they were called pitiful mortal comma that is if they made it through the skeletons to even launch a spell at J anyway. After absorbing nearly 900,000 skeletons, he received these two completely overpowered skills comma obviously. This was meant to be gained much later. When he was an extremely high level, excited about the skills, he didn't even notice the new function comma living blueprints. 
Jay had probably not even killed 1,000 creatures yet, and this gauntlet was clearly meant for a powerful creature which did. It was way beyond Jay's level, not including the skeletons. He had maybe not even killed 100 creatures himself. What he possessed now was probably even beyond the levels of everyone he knew to. The gauntlet itself had a lot of jagged edges and points, particularly at the finger joints. If someone tried to rip it off his hand, they would have their own hands completely shredded. Each finger ended in a sharp tip, almost like claws. On the inside, however, it felt almost like he was wearing nothing. The gauntlet felt light, barely noticeable. It wasn't muggy or hot either, so his hands wouldn't get sweaty. It was almost like it wasn't there. Amazing he turned his hand around and gazed at it. There was an engraving on the palm, but it was hard to make out what it was. It looked like hundreds of thousands of tiny circles. But now, how am I going to hide it? He pursed his lips. Would people believe he found such a finely crafted gothic knight's gauntlet in some low-level dungeon? Hum, all I can say is that I found it here, I have no choice. Technically, I did find it here, I guess, so it's not really a lie. He smiled mischievously, oh well, lying is kinda fun anyway. While walking back to Anya though, a part of him felt wrong for thinking that lying was fun. Was it the immortal book perhaps influencing his thoughts? He wasn't sure. It did seem to be somehow changing both his mind and his heart. Previously, he had no problem with lying. Hum, well, it's not a lie anyway so whatever. He shrugged with a nod. Jay walked back to Anya, holding his shield with his gauntlet hand so that she wouldn't be able to see it back already. Anya slightly smiled. Yeah, are you ready? Ready as ever, she said, standing up with her crossbow. Both of them were in a better mood now that much of the smell had gone comma, or perhaps they had been here long enough to get used to it. Then let's go, Jay said as he grabbed his chair, excited to just finish the pyramid already. The quicker he conquered it, the faster he would be able to find a different dungeon and try out his new gauntlet skills. He really wanted to try the uncaring rip skill on some unwary monster, wanting to see the damage that having a bone ripped out would cause. Yu Jay suddenly shuddered. For some reason he imagined it happening to himself. Perhaps the immortal book wasn't the only thing influencing his mind. There was nothing else in the room after all the skeletons had disappeared. It was just a pit after all. So Jay and Anya walked up the ramp, then back through the passageway. Did you find anything else in here when you had a look? Jay asked. Yes, some more rings. No gauntlets. Jay smiled mischievously. What? No, just the normal Helvetian rings. Hey, never mind you wouldn't get it. He shook his head. Remember half of those are mine. Of course. Anya only raised a brow, wondering what he was on about. Jay continued. Good job with the search. We can split the loot after we leave. Sounds good. She nodded. Before walking back up the stairs to the main entrance, Jay was going to try one more thing. He walked towards the two large storage tanks. What are you doing? Anya said. Just get ready to run. Jay said as he pulled out a tooth. Run. The tooth was vibrating and floating in Jay's hand now. Yeah, run. He said casually as he then sent off the tooth flying towards the one of the cylinders filled with the purple fluid. And began running to the stairs. Anya's eyes bulged, realizing what he did. Boom. The tooth exploded against the massive glass storage tank, shattering the outside, and causing cracks to course through it. Jay, she screamed as she started running. Ha ha ha, Jay smiled as the tank cracked more, and a small torrent of the purple liquid began gushing out. Crack. Boom. Whoosh. Suddenly a large chunk of glass broke away. The storage tank couldn't take it any, the whole thing ruptured. The fluid made a wave through the chamber. A wave of purple glowing liquid began pushing through the whole room. Quickly approaching them, comma, however, they had reached the stairs in time. The skeletons were already at the top of the stairs, much faster than their living counterparts. After scurrying to the top and taking a moment to breathe, Anya looked at Jay with a mix of anger and concern. Jay? Why? Just. Why? Anya looked worried. I dunno. I thought it would be fun. He smiled and shrugged and it was. Anya only shook her head, she couldn't think of anything to say. Jay ignored her and turned around, watching the whole floor of the room being covered with the purple glowing ooze. 
I did warn you to run anyway, he said, still smiling as he gazed at the beautiful destruction. The room looked quite magical after all of it was coated in the glowing purple liquid comma at least until the remainder of the grotesque life form which was previously in the tank floated by anyway. Jay's face scrunched a little seeing it. You, shall we leave? Why yeah. Anya was similarly taking in the view, though she hadn't noticed the long dead abomination corpse. Just after Anya turned and continued up the stairs, Jay held his hand out to the grotesque floating corpse. Amputation, he whispered to himself. Nothing happened. Damn it, maybe I did it wrong, he thought. Unfortunately, it was too late now. The corpse had continued to float by and was too far away. Jay pursed his lips, following Anya up the stairs. They both headed through the metal door and began walking up the passage again. We need to be stealthy again, Jay whispered. Those deep sounds were coming from up here, and that creature could be anywhere. Be ready to leave at a moment's notice. Anya nodded, her expression serious as she became professional again. Chapter 120 The duo crept up the passage with the skeletons in front. Passing the rings of crystals, each of them caused the crystal detectors to light up both green and yellow respectively. Jay remembered that the dehexapod soul eater caused a red light to come from the passage. So it must have lit up red right before he heard the deep booming sounds. Hum, I wonder why it lights up yellow for me and the skeletons. Jay wondered. Anya was the only one who made it green. Strange, he thought as he walked through another. They silently reached the top, the only sound a small party made came from the taping of the skeleton bones. Finally they laid their eyes upon the dehexapod soul eater once more. What Jay's brows were creased, seeing what was in the entrance, he stopped himself from speaking. Before them was a battlefield comma the remnants of one anyway. The massive statues were still standing on their pedestals, however not all of them. The two swordsman giants had been turned to rubble, along with one of the spearmen statues. They aren't just stallus. Anya whispered. Jay was still gazing up at them, nodding slowly with fearful eyes. Between the giant broken statues, the recently slain body of the dehexapod soul eater lay, oozing red blood from its corpse. The human head had blood still pouring from its mouth and eyes, the jaw was still slack. A spear the size of a tree was pinning its body to the ground, along with some giant arrows sticking from its hide, each of them larger than javelins. Giant holes, perforations and slashes riddled its body. No fucking way was Jay's only thought as he looked over the battle scene. The dehexapod was still partly wrapped around the broken legs of the destroyed statues. It clearly didn't go down without a fight. Jay looked over the statues next. Blood was dripping from the spear of the remaining giant spearman statue. The two legless floating statues were both turned, facing towards the dehexapod comma, but unmoving, as if they were frozen in mid-air again. Jay felt it was safe enough to talk quietly since none of them moved. Jay began to ponder over what was going on comma why the statues were arranged the way they were, why there were crystal scanners in the passage, why the dungeon was sealed, why the monster didn't attack them piece by piece, it all fell into place. Anya, I think I understand what this place is he said still looking at the blood dripping off the remaining spearman statue. Anya was still looking at the broken giant statues, with the pierced creature wrapped around and through the rubble of the destroyed swordsman statues. Jay continued, I think it's some kind of failed research facility the statues aren't arranged backwards, because they're not there to keep us out, they're here to keep something in. Anya had a fearful look. She glanced at Jay before looking back at the rubble. Everything fell into place. The creature grew stronger by eating soul stones, obviously it was a threat to any of the statues. I think those green and yellow glowing rings were scanning us, turning red when the creature ran through. That must be when the giant statues got activated. Anya was staring at the giant statues for a moment before she slowly nodded, finally she was ready to talk. I see, should we leave? Do you want to keep going? Anya whispered. Clearly she didn't think the risk was worth the reward. Jay thought for a moment in silence, rolling his tongue in his cheek. It was incredibly dangerous. But it didn't make much sense for a level 3 dungeon to have something that could kill them both in one hit. Furthermore, the creature didn't attack them at all. It seemed that the soul eater could only consume filled soul stones, and perhaps that was all it was interested in. Maybe in the centuries it was down here. It learned to conserve what little energy it had to achieve its goal to consume, killing some ants like Jay and Anya would be a waste of energy. Meanwhile, 
The giant statues only came to life after the scanners turned red, so while they were deactivated, they were not a threat. Could this simply be a sort of puzzle he raised a brow, piecing everything together before answering? I'm gonna keep going. I don't think it's as dangerous as it appears to be. He nodded, walking over to the dead soul eater. The statues could have squashed him easily if they were still active. Jay watched the giant statues for any signs of movement as he walked. This was a test. He of course was ready to use the Asklin skill of his boots in a split second comma not as dangerous as Anya thought it was. Finally reaching the soul eater, he found that he was right comma the statues didn't activate. Jay waved his hand and looted the Soul Eater, pocketing all its Soul Stones. Soul Stone, comma, empty, X-132. Wow, greedy little thing. He smiled at the corpse, not seeing the irony that he was now doing the same thing. Anya still hadn't moved forward, still watching the statues. Some sort of fear had gripped her since she entered this place. I see well. Maybe you should look at the murals before going on, Anya suggested, still whispering. I think I need some time. Maybe come get me when you finish this pyramid. Jay raised a brow, surprised how she was acting. It wasn't like her to be afraid, but there was nothing Jay could do. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for the help. I'll find you when I'm done. Don't forget about my rings. Anya nodded and willed to leave, exiting the dungeon and leaving the party. Party disbanded. She seemed way more scared than usual, actually. It's not like her to be scared at all. Jay thought, I wonder if this pyramid makes people afraid somehow. Maybe it doesn't work on me since I have a monster class. He guessed. It seemed like Anya got more and more fearful the longer they spent in the pyramid. Seeing the slain level 133 soul eater was probably what finally pushed her over the edge. She was at her limit. Perhaps this was some kind of fear effect to stop people from solving the pyramid. Jay guessed. But there was no way of knowing. Jay could only wonder, but he was more surprised that he wasn't scared at all. If there was a fear effect, it was obviously not working on him, comma, perhaps even having the opposite effect. After figuring out the trick, the pyramid now seemed like a walk in the park to Jay. It seemed that this dungeon wasn't only just about blindly killing everything in sight to get stronger. All he had to do now was open the next room in the passageway to the right, open the prison gate before getting out of the way of whatever was down there, waiting in the darkness, as the giant statues did all the work. Well, it sucks not having the extra damage without Anya, but it seems like I won't need it for the rest of the pyramid anyway. I already did a damage challenge to get inside after all. Jay decided to take Anya's advice before heading down the passage and began looking over the murals behind the giant statues. Chapter 121 The murals were not as impressive as the ones in Sedulus's tomb. Jay could tell they had been hastily carved, and it seemed like many of the smaller details had been left out. Whoever made these was clearly in a rush. Unfortunately, part of them had been destroyed during the battle, so Jay now regretted telling Anya to check them later on, when they first entered this pyramid. Looking over them, he found the one Anya was talking about, comma, the one with the pit. A line of soldiers lead to it, while a line of stone statues lead away. Next to the pit was an altar with a single human and a single statue lying on it. The next mural showed the same circular altar with multiple humans and statues on it. Next to that, within the same mural, was the altar again, comma, yet there was a large crab-like creature with two human faces. It was surrounded by statues pointing their large spears at it. The murals continued to form a semblance of a story. Different combinations of humans and statues were placed on the altar. The spell or ritual wasn't revealed by the murals, comma, perhaps this knowledge was too dangerous. But at least the results were shown. It was always some grotesque atrocity when more than one human and statue was used. The vague picture story continued. A large destructive looking spell was descending on the altar, and Jay could tell that this would have been powerful, as the spell was the only thing that had any color on all of the murals. After that, the altar still wasn't destroyed. The construction of the pyramid began around the altar, and the pit comma in this is where the murals ended, the rest had been destroyed. Thankfully, it was enough for Jay to get an idea of what happened here. Combined with what he saw in this pyramid, he could mostly fill in the missing parts of the story. Holvisha invented some hastily crafted, advanced, untested ritual to turn themselves into stone soldiers, comma, this was when they made a discovery, which was adding more than one human and one statue. Driven by blind hatred and revenge, 
They continued attempting to create obscene horrors to hunt down their enemies, the cult who cursed their lands. After realizing these beasts couldn't be controlled, and that this instrument could cause their own downfall, they tried to destroy the altar comma but to no avail. The last option was to seal away the altar in the pyramid. That was where the murals ended comma but Jay had an idea of what happened next, or at least a theory. Based on what he had seen so far, he guessed that Holvisha had not given up on its unchecked desire for revenge. So in this prison, they continued their experiments. A select few master hexamists and mana crafters, along with some guards, were sealed away here. If their enemies ever broke in, they would hopefully be met with creatures that tore them to pieces. The idea was still to lure their enemies back here, in hopes of power and riches. The hexamists perhaps could control and slay the abominations they created at first, using cages and sleeping anesthetic fluids, comma, but over time, as the centuries passed and melded into one another, their minds slowly left them. This only resulted in them becoming more reckless. With their judgment flawed and their impatience mounting, they soon created beasts beyond their control, comma, the same abominations, that would soon consume their creators. Of course, the fail-safe was the giant statues, comma, there to stop any creation from escaping and reaping havoc on what was left of the Helvetian stone military. Jay took this as a lesson, he would not make the same mistakes when he made his first chimera. Jay wondered if he would find the same chimera, another dehexapid, in the passageway to the right or some other failed experiment, comma, of course, there was only one way to find out. The new students should be coming soon. Hopefully, are their rooms prepared? Norgrim, the head of the third academy, sat behind his desk, leisurely eyeing a document as he enjoyed the sunlight coming through the window. He knew that the mage hunters were already on the march to find a necromancer, so time was of the essence, and Jay still had to be convinced to leave with Lannister and Lara. Thankfully, they were proactive about it, and everything was ahead of schedule. Yes, as per your request, I've looked over the details about both of them being placed into the Azure dorms, but I'm not sure it's a good fit for them. Evelyn pursed her lips. Oh, he smiled, stroking his beard. The Azure dorms were luxurious, reserved for the best students who contributed the most to the academy. Only the top students could apply for one, even then there was only a chance of getting a room. Well, these dorms have to be earned. I think the other students will have a problem with it. Mm yes. I suppose so Norgrim leaned back in his chair and looked out the window, watching some red leaves gently falling from the trees. Well, perhaps we can just put him in Wisteria. Put them in Wisteria? Evelyn raised a brow, stressing the word then. Norgrim cleared his throat. Mh. Yes. Them. In Norgrim's view, Jay completely overshadowed Anya. He was wholly focused on Jay. Wisteria was one of the mid-class dorms. Its quality was in between the Azura and the Tawny Dawn, which was reserved for the troublemakers. Very well, I'll make some arrangements. Thankfully we have a few spare rooms in Wisteria. Peter was also wanting to know if they would begin lessons. Oh, I think we'll wait till next year, so they can get a fresh start with other students. How does Peter even know about them? Evelyn smiled, words get around. Yes, I suppose they do Norgrim smiled defeatedly. Well, if that is all. He gestured to the door. Evelyn stood up and turned around to go to the door before pausing for a moment. Norgrim, is he really a necromancer? She asked casually, but Norgrim could tell a glimmer of hope was somewhere in her voice. Norgrim looked up from some notes on his desk. We will just have to see. He smiled. Rumors were already floating around the school about a powerful student coming. Thankfully, none of them knew his name yet as not all of them were positive. The rumors had become quite detached from the truth, as the only real detail they knew was that the new student had a powerful monster class. Even among these variant class students, some of them sneered and many doubted. Despite some of them having a monster class, most of them were weak and unthreatening. PFF, a powerful monster class. Wait till it eats us all in our sleep. Yeah, or maybe it'll probably make us all fall in love with it all. Make us turn on each other and eat each other's brains. Steal our abilities. Replace us with clones that it controls. Curses us with permanent mana burn. All kinds of wild things were floating about the coming adventurer with a monster class. Though there were of course some more different rumors, and some positive ones. I wonder what they're like. Maybe they will power level us. They will lead us to victory. PFFT, 
Have you seen the other monster classes at this school? That guy with the golem class. He's useless ha ha ha. Yeah, and what about that shade class? All he can do is mana burn. So useless. He won't be a threat. Ew, maybe he will make us some micro magic weapons if we ask nicely. Hey, these rumors didn't slip by the headmaster either, comma, he knew Jay had to be protected from some of the other students. So he had to make a decision. Would he have Jay keep his class a secret? Who knows? Suddenly, an idea popped into his head. Hum, they won't like it, but perhaps things will be better this way. Norgrim began drafting a speech which would be announced to the whole school assembly in the coming days. Chapter 122 Jay walked alone down the passage to the right, silently contemplating, wondering how passionate the Helvetians must have been for revenge, to even give up their own lives, and become abominable monsters. He still had his skeletons with him, but technically he was alone. It was a little darker without Anya's brighter luminous orb. He crossed another ring of crystals, and it turned yellow as he passed through. The scanners only meant one thing. M.M. thought so. Must be another laboratory down here. Jay proceeded down to the gate, finding another heavy iron bar. He got the four skeletons to lift it once more. Apparently... The living were prevented from opening it as it heated up and stopped moving whenever Jay touched it, comma, even. When he was too close it wouldn't budge, causing him to step back further. Clun. The heavy bar dropped, and the skeletons pulled the door open. Jay carefully sneaked in, but he knew that whatever was here was probably in hiding. Watching him, it would not be found unless it wanted to be, and Jay's sneaking was only to keep up appearances, comma, perhaps. It would slice him into two halves, if it thought he was mocking it. He began exploring the room for anything that he might be able to use, comma, but he doubted there would be another pit of nearly two million skeletons. So he didn't get his hopes up. Maybe only one million this time. Compared to the other room, this one was quite different. If the other one was used to grow specimens, this one was used to dissect them. Four different size tables were in the room, each of them for different size creatures. Many thick chains and various hooks of different sizes were laying around the room and near the tables, ready to pin down whatever was brought to the cutting slab. Along the tables laid all kinds of cutting instruments, comma saws, picks, crowbars, axes, hammers, and knives of all shapes and sizes. Perhaps the hexamists were trying to salvage any little piece of research or insight they could. Due to all the chains, it seemed that live dissection happened quite regularly here. The dehexapod definitely would not have fitted on any of the stone tables. But that was probably because it had grown to an enormous size. After it turned on its captors, consuming them centuries ago. Hum, if there were dissections, then there are probably skeletons. Jay began to smile mischievously. His hopes for finding skeletons were now growing. Moving deeper into the room, he found some small chambers built into the walls with bars, like prison cells. Some of them had much thicker bars, while others had an interweaving mesh. I wonder what could have been in here, Jay thought. He tried to stick his finger through the mesh. But the mesh holes were simply too small. I itch. Finally, Jay thought as he turned around, his eyes meeting the atrocity as a shiver went up his spine, and he received a notification. Chimera researched 22%. His research went up another 5 perfect just from laying his eyes on the monstrosity before him. He paused as soon as he turned around when he laid his eyes on the creature. It wasn't like he imagined it at all, comma, it definitely wasn't a dehexapid soul eater. Five human heads were melded together. It was like they were all melted wax. That had been hatefully squashed together. Re. The screeching heads were expressionless as they made a high-pitched squeal that seemed to never stop, causing Jay to cover his ears. They all stared at Jay. It felt like they were looking into his heart, which only sent a chill up his spine. The five heads were coated by some sort of thick clear slime. They sat in the middle of a great winding mass of long-segmented tendrils which seemed to be most of what its body consisted of. Jay couldn't see behind the heads, so he wasn't sure how they attached exactly. Each of the numerous black stone tendrils had the familiar soul stone at the end. Fuck, just leave already. Jay yelled as he looked at the door, sick of its unending screeching. Thankfully, the creature didn't take this as a challenge. Following Jay's eyes with its own glossy pupils, it found that the door was open, comma, it was finally free. 
Immediately its long black stone tentacles began carrying it through the exit. Somehow it was much faster than the dehexapod. The cloud of tentacle-like arms suddenly disappeared, comma, though Jay analyzed it just before it slipped away. Still, it screeched all the way up the passage, as it triggered red light to flash from the sensors. Was this a screech for joy? Did it always screech? Jay wasn't sure. Manhattan Soul Eater, comma, level 62. HP 392 slash 392. Skills. Congenital linking comma 2 slash 3. Shares its strength with other creatures. Amalgamation comma soul stones. Consumes comma soul stones to grow stronger. Has become immortal. Dire blades. The manaton strangles and whips its target with its saber tendrils. 76 damage per successful hit. Acidic shards comma passive. Each tendril is coated in numerous tiny shards filled with burning acid. EH minus 0.3. 20 damage per second per shard broken for 3 seconds. Brittle armor. 40% damage reduction to slashing. Stabbing damage. 20% more damage taken from crushing damage. Holvisha's revenge. Magic damage immune. Any wielded weapons become cursed. Description. A soldier of the Holvetian kingdom turned to stone. It stands guard, waiting for its chance to exact revenge on those who would harm its kingdom. Acidic shards. Must be like poison I'm guessing. Jay had never heard of acid before, comma, he was a butcher in a rural village after all. Well, let's see what I can find in here. He thought as he began looking around. Dune, dune, dune. The deep rolling sounds from above began to shake the pyramid once more. The giant statue guardians were activated. I wonder if that's what they sound like when they step down from their pedestals. Jay thought as he looked through more of the cages. Finally, he found what he was looking for, comma, another specimen. Awesome, maybe I can get its bones this time. Chimera researched 23%. He smiled as he looked into the cage and got the notification. It had long since died, but it still had value to Jay. Jay held out his hand trying the new function of his ring once more. Now what was that function called again? Jay hadn't used it enough to remember, so he checked the stats of his new gauntlet again. Oh right, Ampu dash weight living blueprints. How did I miss that? Jay shook his head. Somehow he completely missed out on reading this new function when he analyzed his gauntlet. He checked the skill and wondered what exactly it meant. Of course, he had to try it. Jay pointed his hand at Sweeper. Sweeper looked at Jay, tilting its blue wolf skull cautiously as if it were curious about what its master was doing. Living blueprints. Nothing happened. Hum, amputation. Sweeper's skeleton body suddenly all broke apart and floated in mid-air. Oh shit, Sweeper fucking exploded, Jay chuckled. The bones then gathered, forming a cocoon shape with the wolf skull on the front. It was like a bow on top of a present. Sweeper was now like some self-assembled furniture, a flat pack wardrobe. For some reason it brought Jay a little sadistic happiness, seeing his most obnoxious skeleton being folded up like origami. Green necrotic mana then left Jay's gauntlet hand and wrapped around all the bones, covering them completely. Next, the cloud of green then began to seep into Jay's hand and disappear. Awesome now, to get Sweeper out again. Jay held up his hand, hoping it would be just as simple. Amputation. Nothing happened again. Of course, it wouldn't be simple. Jay then will for Sweeper to come back, imagining the skeleton in his head, closing his eyes, he held out his hand once more. Amputation he said, keeping the image of the blue wolf skull clear in his mind. This time, it worked. A slither of gas poured out from Jay's gauntlet, forming a cloud again, comma the necrotic mana. Then went back into the gauntlet, leaving the package of bones behind, floating in midair. Before Jay's eyes, Sweeper was reassembled, and in a moment, Sweeper stood before him once more. Sweeper looked at its skeletal hands. It was like it was wondering what just happened to it. Jay watched for a moment before looking at his gauntlet. I wonder if it's still conscious while it's in there. Jay raised a brow, stroking his hand over the pale grey necrotic gauntlet. Finally, Sweeper bent down, grabbed its hammer and went back to normal. Weird anyway. Jay turned to the cage, ready to try this new function once more. Poor Sweeper. Chapter 123. Dune, Duan Dune. The giants were still fighting upstairs, meanwhile Jay was sneaking around, looting the pyramid unhindered, right under their noses. Thankfully, Jay didn't trigger the activation sensors, so the giant Helvetian soldiers were none the wiser. 
Jay turned to the experiment cage, peering inside at the centuries-old corpse. The bones inside were blackened, perhaps by time comma or possibly due to the altar experiments. Jay couldn't be sure either way, but no flesh remained at least. Amputation, he said as he held out his hand. Nothing happened. What? Why? He pursed his lips. Out of stubbornness, he tried a few more times, comma, yet nothing. Damn it. Get in my gauntlet already he pushed up against the bars and reached for it, though it was in the very back of the cage. Okay, have it your way, he shrugged. The solution was simple, but bothersome. Jay turned to Sweeper again, amputation. The poor skeleton seemed to have no clue what was happening, as it got folded like a t-shirt once more, entering Jay's ring. Jay then stuck his gauntlet hand into the cage and thought about Sweeper. Amputation. The skeleton reassembled inside the cage. As the skeleton came to terms with existence again, Jay was already barking orders at it. Sweeper? The bone sweeper needed a moment as it turned around, looking at the room around it. Sweeper, the bones. Jay was getting impatient. Finally the confused skeleton kicked into action. It picked up bones from the pile, and just before placing them in Jay's hand, it dropped them in front of Jay. Damn it, sweeper the skeleton still didn't hand them to him. Jay knelt down and grabbed the bones, trying to use his analyze skill as he held it. Hum, nothing appeared. The bone was way too heavy to be a bone, and upon closer inspection, it had a glossy sheen to it. It seemed to Jay that whatever the altar experiment did, it somehow replaced the bone with the black stone material of the pyramids. Damn he pursed his lips, putting his gauntlet hand back into the cage. Amputation. He pulled Sweeper back into the gauntlet before rebuilding the skeleton outside the cage again. Jay thought about the strange bone in his hand for a moment. It actually made sense to him that if the body was made from the heavy black stone, it would need a strong support structure. Chimera researched 24%. A little smile appeared on his face as he received the notification. He managed to glean some more knowledge after all. Thankfully the effort was worth it. Well done Sweeper Jay tossed the black fake bone back into the cage. Jay searched the rest of the chamber. Unfortunately it wasn't as lucrative as the other one. The only skeletons here were not even made from bone, completely useless to Jay. It occurred to Jay that maybe he didn't get the bones from the specimen in the tank because its body was similarly transformed into stone. Jay soon found another one of Estoba's journals. But it likewise turned to ashes as soon as he touched it. Hum. I had better find out who he is. He made another mental note before moving on. Jay finally got to the far corner of the room, and he found something that may have made the trip worth it. A series of wooden crates were stacked up, and he began searching them. The first crate was empty, the second, empty, comma, the third, empty. Jay checked through 13 crates, and all except two were empty. Damn it, he frowned slightly. The two crates were filled with trash, comma, only some wet stones which were probably used to sharpen the dissection instruments, as well as some more of the useless black bones, which technically weren't real bones. With the last part of the room searched, Jay kicked a crate and began to leave, comma, but he stopped after only taking a few steps. Wait a second, shouldn't wooden crates have turned to ashes with everything else? Jay quickly turned around, grabbing one of the crates. Even the nails were corroded and barely hanging on. But the wood was fine, as if it had been cut from a tree yesterday. A curious smile slowly began forming on Jay's face. Since coming to Holvetia, it was perhaps the only normal organic thing he found, comma not. That it was normal anyway. Jay pulled a crate apart and analyzed the wood. Life's wood. Life has touched the tree this wood came from, permanently blessing it. Time resistance 100%. Curse resistance 100%. Resurgence. Can grow back to its former self. Wow so that's why it didn't turn to ash did the Helvetians even realize this wood was blessed. Jay wondered as he began adding all of the wood to his inventory. I'm guessing not since they made them into storage boxes. I wonder what I can do with this. Jay held a piece up. The Helvetians, with their city once covered in beautiful trees and vegetation, perhaps did not think twice about cutting down some innocuous tree, turning it into usable lumber. The wood still had a yellowish glow to it. Some pieces even had some sap on them. But it seemed like that was the best they could do. Since they sat quietly in the darkness for centuries. Ha! Huh, brimming with life. I wonder if I plant it. Can I harvest more of the wood? Hum come to think of it. I also have that weird seed to plant. I guess I can try then as well. 
Jay was yet to find a suitable location for his word seed, comma, he only had one of these, and he doubted he would get another, so he had to be careful, selective about where to grow it. The quest that went along with it also said he had to construct his tree, so he might as well try to plant some of these weird life wood planks. Then too, after having his skeletons break apart the 13 boxes, he got a total of 156 small planks. Awesome. Jay was pleased with this random treasure. He wondered if he should sell it or hold onto it. The downside of selling it was that if it actually could grow back, it would be selling everywhere, and he wouldn't make as much money in the long run. Plus, he considered the possibilities of using it as a sort of counter against time mages, if he ever ran into someone like Kel again. Maybe I'll just hold onto it. I'm sure it'll come in handy someday. Especially if I can grow my own comma and if it doesn't, then I can just sell it anyway. He shrugged. With even the wooden boxes taken, Jay saw nothing left in this room of value. He considered grabbing the iron chains with hooks. But he even had those at his butchery to hang meat, really. Not worth taking. Hum, but in the hands of the skeletons they might be effective. Someday, Jay stroked his chin, imagining a giant being strung up by chains with hooks. Every movement it made would tear its own flesh. Yeah, I'll take some of those too. He grinned. Juicem Chain X8. Juicem Sickle X12. Satisfied with his old haul of loot, Jay headed back up the passage with a spring in his step. Content because he had gained the most from this pyramid, without even lifting a finger. There were no more sounds coming from above, so he proceeded up the passage without sneaking. The scanners flashed yellow again as he passed though, but Jay didn't care. All he was thinking about now was the bonus loot from what remained of the Manhattan Soul Eater. Chapter 124 Jay arrived in the main chamber. It was just as quiet as last time, comma, yet, now another unidentifiable corpse laid below the giant statues. The creature failed to claim any lives of the statues. This time, comma, but they still were not unscathed. The last spearman had strange corroded parts all over it, while its grand tower shield was basically only a small buckler now. Hey, I guess it was a much lower level. Jay looked at the statues making sure they were inactive once more before heading over to gather his loot. Clink. Suddenly, one of Jay's skeletons suddenly collapsed. What? Jay froze, wondering what attacked his skeleton. He instantly looked up at the statues, comma, nope, none of them were moving. He walked over to the collapsed pile of bones. Parts of the skeleton were now bubbling in a puddle of clear ooze. The hell is that? Apart from the puddle, there was a clear crystalline shard, which was crushed, comma, and it seemed to be crushed by the skeleton, as some clear liquid was slowly dripping out, and causing a vapor, when each droplet landed on the ground. Hum, it must be shards from the Manhattan's tentacles. Jay got one of the bones from the collapsed skeleton and prodded it. The bone began to bubble and cause a gas to rise as soon as it made contact. Soon it had disappeared completely. Cool, he thought, not caring too much about his deceased skeleton. Around the room there were even some deep holes in the ground, created by the strong acid as it bore holes into the earth. Huh, so acid must hurt the stone stallions. I guess it's not like a poison at all. Seems more like a fire which burns everything except a liquid. Jay retrieved what was left of the blue bones from the bubbling blue acid. It was initially a clear liquid, but it seems that the cobalt blue bones had colored it after melting into them. Jay re-summoned his skeleton. It was sickly skinny since it had lost bone mass. So he pulled some bones from his gauntlet, creating a small pile, and letting the skeleton feast to its heart's content. The skeleton happily began to munch away at them, while Jay was still putting stuff into the puddle, seeing how much would melt into it. This is some serious shit. He began to look around the room for more of the shards, and soon found one comma still unbroken. A small smile appeared on his face as he tried to pick it up. Acid filled shard. pH minus 0.3. 20 damage per second per shard broken for 3 seconds. Jack fucking pot. Jay grinned. This prize was way stronger than any of the charged crystals he got from the Bearing Dungeon. Even by itself, this shard was like a hidden trump card comma but Jay saw more around the room. Jay scoured the room, avoiding many of the small puddles created, while finding mostly only broken shards comma but it was worth it, as he found two more. Awesome. He smiled. Anything that tries to fuck with me is gonna get its face melted off. The skeleton was still munching. So Jay idly began tossing some stones into one of the acid puddles. 
It's weird, it's kinda like a bottomless pit he thought as he kept dropping stones into it, watching them disappear, realizing he had to rephrase what he previously said. Anything that fucks with me is gonna get its whole upper body melted off. He chuckled. Jay carefully walked around the broken shards and puddles as he looted the Manhattan Soul Eater. Soul Stones, comma, empty, X-132. Unfortunately, there was no Helvetian ring. The skeleton had finished snacking and reclaimed its former glory. Time to check the last passage. Jay grabbed the rest of the bones before leaving the battle scene. The middle passage was dark and dormant, daring anyone to enter. Jay walked through the middle passageway ready to fight. Unlike the other two which went downhill, this one went upwards. It seemed like he may actually need to do something other than listen to the giants fight. Well, the skeletons would do something at least. It was eerily quiet as they walked along the pitch black passage. But soon Jay heard a soft buzzing sound. A resonance of energy. Must be getting close. Whatever is up there sounds powerful, Jay thought. The humming sound getting louder. As he walked he came to another iron door. This room was similarly sealed off like the others. But the metal bar had no inscriptions. Jay could lift the bar if he wanted to. Unlike the other passages, there weren't any scanners in the passage. Something didn't feel right to Jay as he got his skeletons to open the door anyway. A blue light came from behind the door, radiating outwards as the skeletons pulled it open. The first thing Jay noticed in the room was a throne, empty. On the wall behind it was the source of the light, two large glowing circles filled with glowing blue inscriptions which lit up the room. These inscriptions were what were making the humming noise. It seemed that they were filled with magnitudes of power. There was a third circle filled with inscriptions, but no glow. It seemed deactivated. There's usually some stupid trick or puzzle. The pyramid can't be this easy. Jay thought as he waited at the doorway, not stepping a single foot into the room until he knew it was safe, and had properly analyzed everything he could from there. On one side of the room there were small cages, and on the other were more small glass tanks, filled with more of the purple liquid. Various pillars were around the room, holding up the ceiling, each with their own set of distinct claw marks. It was like a different beast was unleashed on each pillar. Near the cages was an incredibly long table. It had various talons, claws, cleavers, arms, legs and appendages on it. It seemed to be another dissection area. Hum, this must be like miniature versions of the labs downstairs. Tap 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 tap. Jay still hadn't stepped foot into the room, but our fast tapping noise came from somewhere in the room, causing Jay to step backwards and raise his shield, preparing for whatever was coming. Jay sent three skeletons into the room to secure the entrance, while he had the third stay by his side. H-I-S-S-S-S. Something responded as the skeletons marched in. Entering the territory of another hostile failed experiment, they were clearly not welcome. Suddenly, something dropped from the roof, knocking the three skeletons down. Fuck Jay said as he crouched a little lower, waiting for it to bowl him over, anticipating that it would made a mad dash for the exit. Suddenly it hissed a little more deeply and ran off, back into the room somewhere. It happened so fast that Jay couldn't tell what the creature was and he had no time to analyze it. All he could see was a Helvetian T-Visor helmet, one of those long tentacles similar to the Manhattan Soul Eater, and a long segmented body with multiple legs, similar to the Dehexapod, comma yet with no soul stones, were poking out of its body, at least from what Jay could tell. Whatever it was seemed to be an ungodly mixture of all three, a Manhattan, a Dehexapod and a stone statue. The skeletons stood up again, this time one of them watched the ceiling, making sure that this wouldn't happen again. Jay noticed one of the skeleton's hammers had a splatter of red blood on it. Somehow it must have injured the beast when it went down during the struggle. This gave Jay a sign that it in fact could be injured. It definitely wasn't level 133 like the Dehexapod. If it bleeds, we can kill it, he said as he gripped his shield and hammer a little more tightly. With some assurance, he cautiously entered the room. If the skeleton could injure it, he surely could too. The skeletons were all standing, but as Jay got closer to them, he noticed a difference, comma, one of the skeletons had half of its rib cage missing, comma, it had been ripped right out. Looking around, Jay couldn't find any bones or ribs on the ground. Did the creature take the ribs with it? What the hell does it want with half a rib cage? Jay decided not to feed the skeleton. He wanted all hands on deck until he knew how powerful the monster was. Thankfully the blue light coming from the two large circular glyphs on the wall were illuminating most of the room. 
so he could at least see if it was anywhere on the roof. There were a few pillars in the room that the creature could have been hiding behind, but he soon found that there was a small room off to the right, shielded from the light. It was in complete darkness. Hum, he squinted as he gazed suspiciously into the darkness. Jay sent one skeleton to peer into the room, looking for anything moving. Slowly, Jay was learning to delegate orders to his skeletons rather than do it himself. It was a skill that came natural to some, but to others it had to be practiced. The skeleton silently crept over. It wasn't in sprinting mode at the moment as it went to inspect. Its undead shade vision allowed it to see in the dark perfectly. The skeleton peered around the corner into the darkness of the room, and once more was met with hostility. Hiss! The skeleton stepped back, but it wasn't quick enough comma a long spindly twig-like hand with incredibly long fingers appeared from the darkness and grasped the skeleton's neck, quickly snatching it into the darkness. It happened so fast that the skeleton dropped its hammer, unable to even swing once. Of course, it still had its natural weapons, its claws. See? Your perennial creature level 3 has been slain. Jay got a notification as he guessed that the skeleton at least did some damage before it died. Since the creature let out a different sound. It sucked to lose a skeleton. But at least he now knew that it was in that room. Before moving in, Jay pulled some bones from his ring and re-summoned the level 3 skeleton. This time, he was forced to use the bones from the pit. These were all he had. The skeleton took its form once more. But this time it had a human skull. A weird feeling of accomplishment came over Jay. Despite it being just another summoning. For some reason, the skeleton just made more sense. Its form was no longer a warped skeleton of an animal that was cruelly forced into a humanoid shape. But it was a literal human skeleton. Hum. Peak performance. Jay wondered. Hiss. Clink. The creature seemed to still be attacking the bones, as clinking sounds came from the room. Jay realized this wasn't time to ponder over strange details. So he promptly sent two more blue skeletons in, along with the new human skeleton. It killed one of our own. No mercy. Go he waved his hand as if shooing away a stray animal. The skeletons all sprinted in. The human one grabbing the hammer as it ran into the darkness. Hiss. The creature once more hissed deeply, wondering why these puny skeletons thought they could just march into its territory. What despicable insects. Jay idly stood near the exit, ready to summon more skeletons if need be as he listened to the fight. Doom. Cling. Hiss. Shatter. Doom. See. Your skeleton level 3 has been slain. Again. Jay hastily summoned another skeleton and sent it off into the room as he waited. As he cleaned some dirt from under his fingernails he noticed something different raising a brow. Wait a second, skeleton has been slain. Didn't it say perennial creature before? Chapter 125. Wait a second, skeleton has been slain. Didn't it say perennial creature before? Jay quickly re-summoned the skeleton, analyzing it. Skeleton level 3 comma blue. Type comma undead. HP comma 40 slash 40. MP comma 7 slash 7. Skills. Bone Eater. Scrimshaw level 1 comma passive. Undeath comma passive. Fear comma weak comma passive. Shade vision comma passive. Description. In abomination, its existence spits in the face of life, and death comma and they spit back. Flee if possible. Execute with extreme prejudice. Hum, no corundum bite since that came from the wolf skull. No corundum claws either. I guess the only difference is the name and five less health. Oh, wait, fear. J analyze the strange new skill. Fear. A gentle tapping in the back of one's mind. A cold breath on the neck. A gazing shadow on the very edge of one's vision. You can run, but not forever. You can kill it, but not forever. The human skeleton creates an unnatural sense of fear in humans, reducing morale and concentration. 1% less strength. 0.03% chance of fleeing. Higher chance of more skeletons than humans. Higher chance of higher level than human. Ha, huh, cool. Weird that it would make such a change though. Jay scratched his head, thinking that the wolf skull skeletons were much more menacing. I wonder if the fear effect would be better than the extra damage. It seems like if I had a high level army of them, then they would cause everyone to flee. Hum, I guess it depends if the fear effect stacks. It seems like it's a true skeleton now. Quite fitting for a pure necromancer. Good thing I have a large stockpile of human remains. Jay smiled to himself as he imagined his future army. 
Jay sent the skeleton off once more to die in the glorious battle taking place in the next room. He waited patiently as he heard the occasional hiss sound with the crunching noise of the hammers mixed in. It seemed that the pace of battle had been set now, so he decided to investigate. It wasn't as safe as waiting near the door, but his curiosity was getting the better of him. Besides, the skeletons were mostly fine, so it couldn't be too dangerous, and Jay wanted to at least analyze it before they killed it anyway. Still keeping his guard up, Jay went to peer around the corner to look at the shrieking, hissing beast. Finally, he laid his eyes upon the monster. Chimera researched 28%. Another notification sounded, but Jay ignored it. He was too shocked by what he saw, comma, somehow his skeletons were fighting this thing without dying. Well, without getting completely demolished anyway, since one of them was dying. Most of its long, insect-like body was like a wall of blades, yet somehow the skeletons were damaging it. This abomination was a mix of everything he had seen in this dungeon. So far, comma, a dehexapod, a manaton, and a stone soldier. Its long body with skittering legs resembled the segmented fleshy body of the dehexapod from the waist down, while the upper body was that of an uncompleted stone soldier. It seemed like an anorexic version. Whoever this person once was would have been starving, maybe even on their last breath right before they were turned to stone. Under its T-visor helmet a slack jaw slung, endlessly hissing, so it seemed that not all of it had been turned to stone. Two long tendrils hung over its shoulder, threatening to coil around any unsuspecting prey, each of them coming from the back of the creature's neck. Thankfully all the shards on them had already been cracked open and harmless. It seemed like they would need a long time to grow back. Its arms were not like normal stone soldiers. They were long and thin, like a spindly dead branch. It seemed that their bones had turned to the strange black rock, but the flesh and muscles hadn't, leaving them victims to time. The flesh had either turned black or fallen off, revealing most of the crude mineral skeleton underneath comma still. Only held together by some ancient, twisted magic that even the Helvetians couldn't destroy. After staring for a moment, Jay wasn't sure if he was fearful or impressed by the strange creation. Simply put, he was in awe. Finally, he analyzed it. The assistant comma level 8, HP 67, slash 121, congenital linking comma 1 slash 3, shares its strength with other creatures, slender hands, has a specialized arm that rips parts from its enemies, adding them to itself if it favors the part, chance to execute comma 12% higher chance versus lower level, 3 minute cooldown, amalgamation comma body parts, consumes comma body parts to grow stronger has become immortal, dire blades, comma, tendrils, comma, legs. The assistant strangles and whips its target with its saber tendrils. The assistant slashes its target with its saber talons. 4.8 damage per successful hit. Semi-Aphrodite degradation. Unwhole, it has given up a piece of itself. Nesting, acidic shards, comma, passive. Each tendril is coated in numerous tiny shards filled with burning acid. EH minus 0.3. 2.5 damage per second per shard broken for 3 seconds. Brittle armor. 40% damage reduction to slashing, stabbing damage. 20% more damage taken from crushing damage. Holvisha's revenge. Magic damage immune. Any wielded weapons become cursed. Description. A researcher of the Holvetian kingdom turned to stone. It works tirelessly, waiting for its chance to exact revenge on those who would harm its kingdom. Oh, it basically has its own uncaring rip skill. Jay shook his head, it's no wonder the skeletons are suffering. Fortunately, only one of the long spindly arms remained, comma, the other had been severed at the elbow. It was a welcome advantage, but not much of one. The combat prowess of the creature seemed to mostly rely on its bladed legs and the two tentacle-like appendages coming from its neck. The skeletons were having a hard time injuring it, as the creature swiped and thrashed whenever a hit landed, knocking them away and damaging them with its sword-like legs, or simply slashing their skulls. Nevertheless, it was still outnumbered 3 to 1, and it seemed to be going pretty even, comma, at least until Jay had decided to send in his fourth skeleton. Now, there was only one outcome for the battle, and Jay was waiting patiently. Scree. Hiss. The creature knew it was fighting a losing battle. But it wasn't going to go down without a fight, and neither would it leave its home. 
This was its chamber, its own piece of the world which it had carved out for itself. It was enjoying the darkness here for hundreds of years, comma, then suddenly these strange bipedal wolf undead show up, waving their hammers. Nope, not today. Only it would remain here, finding peace in its solitude with itself, comma, like it always had been since it could remember. These intruders would only be consumed, perhaps it would find a new arm today. Crunch. Another hammer swing smashed against its blue ribs, shattering them off. Instead of reacting in pain, it suddenly leant forward, reaching with its long spindly arm. It ignored the pain, taking another heavy hit from a hammer which destroyed one of its 16 legs. Instead of thrashing about, it dashed closer to the skeleton, quickly reaching out with its huge long fingers. The black hand wrapped completely around the skeleton's skull. The skeleton could only respond with awkward upward swings of its hammer. But the hammer only missed this time. It seemed helpless as if its fate was sealed. It was pushed down for just a slight moment before. See ah uh, crunch. The creature suddenly twisted the skull. Then tilted it to the side. And with a fast motion ripped it right off the spine. Without a head, the body of the skeleton collapsed into a useless inanimate bone pile. Before Jay's eyes, the execution happened so quickly and almost without any warning. The skull was then tossed somewhere into the back of the room. Fuck Jay's eyes bulged as he watched silently. The monster's execution skill must have had a much higher chance against his level 3 skeletons. Jay decided he would definitely not be joining this fight, as he subconsciously took a step back comma instead. He resummoned another skeleton, and continued to watch from the sidelines. See ah uh, crunch. A few more minutes into the battle, the creature ripped another skull off a skeleton, prompting Jay to summon another. Thankfully, it had only killed an individual skeleton so far. Blue. The other three wolf skull skeletons were doing fine. They had some damage, but it was nothing that Jay couldn't fix, though it would take some time. Since Jay had summoned a level 3 skeleton multiple times, he was beginning to feel the effects of having low mana, as it seemed like the fight appeared more dangerous than what it actually was, comma, that it was speeding up. Technically, the creature was fighting with more ferocity as its life was now beginning to dwindle. But the skeletons always fought with 100% of their might. Their aggression in battle was always turned up to the maximum. Hum, I'll need to sit down soon. He thought, hoping the creature would just accept its fate and die already. As its health was nearing zero, the creature suddenly let out another screeching noise. What seemed like the final heroic cry of a dying warrior. Scree. It then twirled, knocking all the skeletons back with its tail, and immediately started dashing straight towards Jay. Oh. Oh. Dot oh. Oh. Shit. He immediately turned to run. Jay ran towards the exit as fast as his feet could carry him, but he was simply too slow. His only choice was to fight it. But how could he fight while his reflexes were so slow now that his mana was low? And how long had it been since the creature had grabbed a skeleton skull and ripped it off? At this point, it didn't matter. What mattered now was the fight. Jay hastily took out his hammer and prepared for the knockback, assuming a low position as he braced himself for the charge. He didn't have to fight it. He only had to survive. The skeletons would catch up in no time, being just a little slower than the creature. Here it comes Jay gritted his teeth as he braced for impact. Thwoosh. The creature smashed against Jay's shield like a charging war horse. Against its massive size, he simply had no hope to stand against it. His shield had blocked the damage, but not the force of the hit. Jay was tossed away like he was a leaf in a storm comma, but even as he was helpless in mid-air, he wasn't done. Uncaring rip. Screer. It squealed in pain as Jay was sent flying into a pillar. And that was all he remembered. Blackness. Thank you guys for listening. This was my necromancer class. Next chapter's coming soon. P.S. Numerous editing of text are made to make it cleaner for listening. This may delay uploads. But it'll do my best to work on it faster when I come home from work. I also like to listening to it. So it helps laughing face. Thank you again at MD. Have a wonderful day.